Test, test. This is a test for Vitech. Closed caption. Test, 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 test. This is Chambers. Test for Vitech. Test, test.
But I don't need this. If you're here for the We're going to begin the hearing. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start the chair. Today is December 12, 2018. Good morning and welcome to this hearing on the New York City's Council's Economic Development Committee. My name is Councilmember Vallone, and I have the privilege of chairing this hearing. Uh, since Speaker Johnson has called this hearing, we're going to turn the floor to him to make the first round of opening remarks. However, I'd just like to lay down some of the ground rules before we get the ball rolling today. First of all, I know we have a lot we want to get to, uh, and once we start that, we're going to ask the council member questions to be limited to four minutes each, and as the day goes on, we may have to drop that to three. Um, we're also going to try to include some of the public questions that you see here on the side from Twitter using hashtag at Amazon Answers NYC. Second, since we will not have time for regular public testimony at today's hearing, we encourage you to submit questions to the council on Twitter using the hashtag at Amazon Answers NYC. Again, that is M at Amazon Answers NYC. We will also keep that hashtag up on the screen for the duration of this hearing. We aim to include as many of those questions as we can at the end of the hearing to allow some public questions after this process. I'm now going to turn the floor over to Speaker Johnson for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Vallone. Good morning. I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I want to thank everyone for coming here today for this very important hearing with a special shout out uh, to my friend and colleague, Councilmember Paul Vallone, the Chair of the Economic, Develop Economic Development Committee. I want to thank you, Paul, for your leadership uh, and for calling this hearing so quickly. I'd also like to acknowledge Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, who has been an outspoken advocate for his constituents ever since the details of this deal came to light. The people of Long Island City, Astoria, Sunnyside, and Woodside will be the first ones to see the impact of this project for which they had zero input, and they have a strong leader looking out for their needs in Councilmember Van Bramer. I want to thank you, Jimmy. I'd also like to recognize the other council members who are with us this morning, Councilmember Adrian Adams from Queens, Councilmember Brad Lander from Brooklyn, and Councilmember Peter Koo from Queens. This hearing today, the hearing today is, is fairly atypical for a land use project of this size. The city council is typically deeply involved in the negotiations and has a real seat at the table. That, of course, did not happen in this case. There's a reason why the City Council is so deeply involved in land use. The whole process was designed to protect the people who we each represent. Yes, the Mayor and the Governor also represent the people of New York City. As, Deputy, as the Deputy Mayor pointed out in defending this deal to New York Magazine, 
but the city charter specifically tasked the New York City Council with land use authority. ULERP, as the process is known, was designed so communities could figure out what's needed to accommodate the kinds of changes that development can bring, be it new schools, transit upgrades, or infrastructure improvements. During the land use process, the community can and does advocate for changes because they know what adding, say, 25,000 workers or a noisy helipad means to the area. Listening to people is how we encourage growth that is supported by communities and works for the city as a whole. We have a crumbling subway system, record homelessness, public housing that is in crisis, overcrowded schools, sick people without health insurance, and an escalating affordable housing crisis. Is anyone asking if we should be giving nearly $3 billion in public money to the world's richest company, valued at $1 trillion, instead of focusing on these outstanding problems? Meanwhile, the state's analysis predicts 131,000 extra New York City residents because of this deal. Has anyone asked how this is going to impact housing prices and rents in New York City? I'm already seeing stories of a real estate boom in Long Island City. Is that a good thing? Not to most New Yorkers who are already struggling to afford their rents here. How will small businesses, who if we're being honest, are already reeling because of the impact Amazon has had on their bottom line, how will they be affected? How will this affect our overburdened transportation system in an area where infrastructure is already limited? The only transportation piece of this project I've seen involves a helipad. I'm serious. This is like something out of the onion. So yes, Jeff Bezos' commute is all set, but what about the rest of New Yorkers who are crammed into subways every single day? The seven train is already a disaster. Did anyone ask its new trillion dollar neighbor if they could kick in to help make it better? We have a lot of questions, which is why we're here today. Tough questions that should have been asked from the start. Maybe they were asked from the start, but we don't know that. Tough questions that the public has the right to hear answers on. Today is the first day of our hearings where we will talk about the process. And we're doing it, as the council does, out in the open so the public can listen and understand what's at stake. In the coming months, we'll have more hearings, including one in which we invite members of the public to testify. We will also monitor our social media today to find questions from New Yorkers, some of which we'll ask at the end of this hearing. If you're watching and have a question, please use the hashtag, hashtag Amazon Answers NYC, and we will try to get your question asked. I'll close by thanking everyone for being here today and watching online. I can assure you that our goal today is to advocate for what's in the best interests of New York City. And before I turn it back over to Chair Vallone, uh, before we get to our questions today, uh, I want to uh, say that uh, I, I don't understand how you subvert the public review process. I am very grateful that the Economic Development Corporation is here today. Uh, James Patchett, I think, is a very able person in this city and someone who I've had a good relationship with. So I look forward to having a conversation with him about this project. I am very grateful that Amazon is here to answer our questions, but you know we shouldn't have to beg for a company that's coming to New York City to come here. I'm glad they're here, but it's not special to come and answer our questions. It's good you're here. It's good you're going to answer our questions. But this, this, you know, if you're proud of the deal, if you're proud of coming to New York City, you should have said, I want to come and talk about the deal. I want to come and answer every question imaginable that this body has or that the public has. This should not be a two-step tango to get you to come here and speak with us. Now, the Economic Development Corporation agreed immediately to come, which I'm grateful for. And I'm grateful that Amazon is here. But today is about answering questions. Today is about transparency. 
Today is about understanding the impacts of the taxpayer dollars involved in the land use process of New York City being subverted in the infrastructure challenges that arise from this deal from gentrification concerns and displacement concerns and retail concerns and helipad concerns. That's what today is about. So I look forward to having a fulsome conversation where we have direct question and answers with each other to understand the impacts of this deal. And again, I just want to say, if the city and the state should be here as well, ESD should be here. If the city and state and Amazon are proud of this deal, they should be proud and willing to answer all of our questions in the manner that this body is asking. If you want to come to New York City and be a good neighbor, you should be willing to come here and testify and work with us and talk to us in an open way. So I look forward to this conversation today. It's an important conversation to have. And I look forward to us, given the level of public money involved and public land involved, I look forward to us having this be the beginning of the conversation, not the end of it. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. It truly is an honor to have you sitting us, with us today, chairing over this hearing. I'd like to extend my thanks. Well, we've also been joined by Council Members Rivera and Powers. Council Members will be coming and going. There are many hearings on today, so we'll be acknowledging as they come. I'd like to extend my thanks to the members of the committee as well as EDC President James Patchett and Holly Sullivan and Brian Hausman from Amazon for coming here today on relatively short notice to have this, as the speaker said, unique hearing. There are serious concerns we'll hear today from our fellow council members surrounding the parameters of the Amazon contract. This hearing will focus on the terms of the agreement that still remain to this day unclear to many New Yorkers. There will be at least two additional hearings, as the speaker said, one from finance and one from land use and an additional one for public testimony. Amazon's optimistic numbers in the MOU suggest that 25,000 jobs will be created in 10 years and up to 40,000 jobs in 15. What assurances do we have that these jobs will actually go to the residents of New York City and not an imported workforce? How will we protect the immediate and surrounding communities from the domestic cost of living in Long Island City? How will we support and protect the small businesses in and around the Amazon HQ2 location? How will the increased demands on the infrastructure be planned and addressed? What local input and guarantees will be made to these communities as the impact on a yearly basis grows? And how did the adjacent properties owned by the private entity Plaxol become part of a transaction when they were subject to ongoing U.R. processes that are now pulled from our jurisdiction? You'll hear many of these kinds of questions today from our council members concerned about a project this magnitude will impact locally owned businesses throughout our city. As the speaker has pointed out about transit and other infrastructure, what are the plans to support those? If you plan on having 40,000 people at this location, how will they get there? Are you in discussions with the MTA to ensure the 7 train runs more frequently? What about the Long Island Railroad stop at Hunters Point Avenue in Long Island Railroad City? Those only operate during rush hour. Are these plans to offer more regular service out of these stations? How about the ferry? The current Long Island City ferry landing is across the 11th Street Basin from the lots where Amazon HQ2 is slated to be built. Are there plans to provide a footbridge across the 11th Street Basin? So many of these questions remain and continue to be asked. These are going to be the problems that the employees face every day going to and from HQ2, and these are hyper-local questions regarding employment, logistics, and infrastructure that you miss when your process cuts out the local elected officials who live in and understand the communities impacted. These are just a few of the many concerns that we look to have answered today at our upcoming hearings. I hope this hearing will be the process to finally allow the council to have the voice in what's being billed as the largest economic development project in the city's history. We are also looking forward to hearing Amazon's voice and vision for their entire and their entry into New York City and what their plans as they plan to integrate into our great city. Before we begin, I'd like to send my thanks to the speaker once again and to his entire team and central staff, as well as to my Economic Development Committee team, Legislative Council of Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Emily Forjone, and Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali for the very hard work for making sure this hearing came together so quickly. Finally, I'd like to reiterate that due to the nature of this hearing, once again, there will be time limits. Um, we do have security around, but I have true faith in the New Yorkers that are here that we want to hear what is going to be said today, that our voice wants to be heard, uh, and that we won't need those additional steps today. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that was done by the council members here in such a short period of time. And most of these documents, this was yesterday. And there's only much you can do in 24 hours when you start reviewing that. So with that, I'd like to turn over to Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer for comments 
since the district of which he resides and looks over is where this will be most impacted. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank the speaker for his steadfast support uh, of my work uh, and my advocacy for my district, and also thank Chair Vallone. Uh, shortly after my Congress member elect won her primary in June, Mayor de Blasio said, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is someone who absolutely comes from my wing of the Democratic Party. But that begs the question, which wing was he speaking of? Is it the corporate wing that provides billions in taxpayer subsidies to the richest men in the world, or the wing that bypasses local communities to grease the wheels for an unprecedented act of corporate welfare? The mayor rightfully talks about ending the tale of two cities, yet he is cheerleading a backroom deal that literally pays Jeff Bezos to build his gleaming tower in the sky, while the residents of the Queensbridge houses, many of whom are freezing because of the lack of heat, can watch Amazon executives bypass the subways and land their corporate helicopter on a taxpayer-funded helipad. Transparency is a hallmark of good governance, so we should all be concerned that the city was eager to promise Amazon that they would bypass local land use review and agree to sign non-disclosure agreements while doing so. The memorandum of understanding is shocking and shameful in how much it gave to Amazon and how little it extracted from them for the community. Amazon is a trillion dollar corporation with a record that should disturb all of us when it comes to organized labor and its treatment of workers. And it's important to note that while deals have been struck with some unions, no direct Amazon employees in Queens will be unionized as a result of this deal. And if we are horrified by the Trump administration's policy of separa separating immigrant families, shouldn't we be equally horrified by Amazon's desire to cooperate and assist ICE? Now the governor, who ironically has decried those of us who oppose the deal as pandering politicians, <clears throat> but then offered to change his name to Amazon Cuomo. <laughs> He's pretty clear about who he is and his clear support for this deal. I strongly disagree with him. But it's our progressive city that cannot hide behind the governor here by saying that the city didn't provide discretionary tax incentives. We signed on to the billions in subsidies. The city approved of the secretive process. The city even agreed to Bezos's damn helipad. It is the party of progressives like Sanders and Warren who believe that this deal is a betrayal of our core values. The mayor and the governor participated in this process, which was dictated by Amazon. Now, I was wrong to sign the letter supporting New York's bid, but that makes this bad deal no less bad, because the council and the people of the city and the state were excluded from knowing any of the details of this deal, and we must now reclaim our rightful oversight responsibilities and ask the tough questions of this administration under oath. I was not elected to be a cheerleader for Amazon, and neither was the mayor. This is a moment of truth when those of us who care about income inequality must reject progressives who in practice recite corporate Republican talking points that espouse trickle-down economics and falsely claim that all boats will be lifted here. That was a lie when Ronald Reagan said it in the early 1980s, and it remains a lie today. We should all be concerned about monopoly power and its growing dominance on the marketplace. Monopolies aren't good for Main Street. They aren't good for small businesses. We've seen this movie before. There is a saying that if you want to know where someone is going, ask someone who knows where they've been. For that reason, I've been working closely with members of the Seattle City Council, where Amazon has its first headquarters. They've each shared stories about how Amazon has aggressively fought progressive legislation and spent considerable amounts of money through independent expenditure campaigns to target candidates who do not tow the company line. The Seattle City Council members told me about their effort to pass a tax on the biggest corporations to help fund homeless services. They also told me about Amazon's immediate attack campaign after it was unanimously passed. Amazon flexed their corporate muscle to build enough support to defeat the tax, pressuring the council to eventually repeal the legislation less than a month later. 
Now, I fully expect to be the target of one of those future attack campaigns and independent expenditures, but I'm not backing down and I'm not going to stop fighting. We've got to eliminate the influence of big corporate money in elections. Queens must not become another Amazon company town. This is a bad deal. It's bad for Long Island City, it's bad for Queens, and it's bad for New York City. The mayor and the governor caved to the richest man on earth and then handed the bill to each and every New Yorker. It's wrong, and we as a society must rethink our approach to economic development and corporate wel welfare. Thank you to the speaker, to the chair, to all my council colleagues, and I look forward to asking the tough questions. All right, turn it back over to our speaker, Corey Johnson, to introduce our panel. I want to call up the president of the Economic Development Corporation, James Patchett. I know that we had discussed having the Economic Development Corporation go first and Amazon uh, to go uh, second. Uh, I, I say this uh, not in any way to uh, try to uh, trick anyone or move the goalposts, but I think there are going to be questions that we have that, for a more efficient manner, go back and forth so that EDC doesn't say, well, Amazon can answer that question, and then when Amazon's up there, they can say EDC can answer that question when EDC's not up there. So I, I want to let EDC uh, read their testimony, their opening statement uh, first, but I would also like for Amazon to be up there so that if there are questions that pertain to this that EDC might not be able to answer, given the nature of the conversation, that we can have uh, that type of discussion. So I would also appreciate if Amazon's okay with it, unless you are going to resist doing it, uh, I would appreciate Holly Sullivan and Brian Hausman to also uh, join the table and let EDC go first, and if it's necessary for us to ask Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Hausman uh, questions as necessary. Thank you for that. We've also been joined by Council Members Menchaca, Williams, Rose, and Levine. So we're going to swear in uh, this panel, all four of you, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and in your response? Hey, stop, stop it. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Hey, excuse me, please, hold on, hold on. Give me one second. Everyone, hey, hello. Just give me one second. Today, we're, you can tell by the tenor of today's hearings at the outset that we have difficult questions. Clearly, some of the folks that are here and engaging in civil disobedience uh, are upset, understandably. But we want to be able to have this conversation, which is the first opportunity for us to have this conversation. So we can't have interruptions like this. If it happens again, and you'll be kind of being unfair to everyone else here, we will clear the entire balcony. And we we'll, don't want to do that. We will clear we the entire hear, balcony. We want you to be part of this. We want you to all to be part of it. The we can't have we a hearing if you're going to interrupt. That's not the way it works here. So. As I said, we're going to have a big public hearing where anyone can come and testify for as long as they want. But if that happens, the next time that happens, we will clear the entire balcony so that we can have a real conversation and ask real questions today. You're welcome to stay and listen and come to the public testimony and tweet questions that we can ask. But if that happens again, we're going to ask the NYPD and the sergeants here to clear the entire balcony. So it's up to you if you want that to happen. The next time it happens, that's what we're going to do. So um, raise your right hand. If you could raise your right hand, do you swear and affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patchett. <clears throat> Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Valone, and members of the Economic Development Committee. I'm joined by Lydia Downing, the Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations at EDC. I'm James Patchett, the President and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. We're responsible for driving and shaping economic growth across the five boroughs. EDC, in conjunction with our, our state counterpart, the Empire State Development Corporation, led the bid to bring Amazon's new headquarters to New York City. 
I'm here today to discuss that process, the 25,000 jobs that will result, and the outside positive impact it is projected to have. I'll be happy to answer any questions following my testimony. I'm sure you might have a few. Four weeks ago, Amazon announced that it selected Long Island City for its new headquarters. This is the single biggest job creation opportunity in New York's history. Amazon is committed to creating at least 25,000 jobs over the next 10 years, with potential to expand to 40,000 in 15. It is projected to deliver over $27.5 billion in tax revenue to the city and state over the next quarter century. These figures make it clear that Amazon's presence will fortify the city's economy and give thousands of New Yorkers new viable pathways to the middle class. Today, when the city's unemployment rate is at 4%, a record low, and home to 4.5 million jobs, it's easy to believe that New York is safe from future economic blows. Critics may say that our economic foundation is strong and we don't need these jobs. But as the head of the city's Economic Development Corporation, I have a responsibility to ensure we never become complacent and fail to prepare for the next recession. And we know there will be a next recession at some point. We only need to look at the very recent past to show how vulnerable our city can be and how some downturns can be catastrophic. In fact, it's not hyperbole to, have, to say a few have threatened the city's very existence. In April 1988, the city's unemployment rate was 4.6%, the lowest it had been in 18 years. But by 1992, unemployment was close to 12%. At that moment, an economic development project like this would have been welcomed with open arms. In February of 2001, the city's unemployment rate was 5.1% which was a low for that period. Yet seven months later, Lower Manhattan lay in ruins and no one was sure that any CEO would ever locate her company in the city again. In that moment, an economic development project like this would have been welcomed with open arms. In January of 2007, the city's unemployment rate was 4.6%. Less than two years later, the collapse of a Wall Street titan put the city's economy in free fall and the entire financial services industry in jeopardy. By October of 2009, the unemployment rate had spiked to over 10%, and it wouldn't return to 4.6 for another 10 years. In that moment, an economic development project like this would have been welcomed with open arms. I recognize that there are concerns about Amazon coming to New York, but I would urge us not to lose sight of the most crucial part of this story. Amazon's presence is vital to our efforts to diversify the economy and safeguard ourselves from future downturns like these, or even worse, another fisc fiscal crisis. We ultimately emerged from the fiscal crisis, but we were not unscathed. The city lost about 5,000 police officers, police officers in a mass layoff. The city workforce was cut by 65,000, and for the first time, CUNY students had to pay tuition, which resulted in 70,000 students leaving the school. This is also about the future of Queens. Elected officials and community leaders have spent decades trying to encourage commercial development in Long Island City. This is still a smart strategy. Long Island City sits at the geographic center of the city, is well served by local and regional transit, and is near regional airports. Despite these strengths, turning the neighborhood into a central business district has proven to be an uphill battle time and again. In 1990, Citibank opened its Court Square headquarters, which brought roughly 3,000 jobs to the community. This is supposed to be a watershed moment, one that would spark a renaissance for jobs in Long Island City. But the predict predicted mass migration of companies never happened. Instead, Queens continued to lose ground on good paying jobs to places like Jersey City and Stamford. In 2001, the City Council voted 31 to 0 to approve a 37 block rezoning for Long Island City in the hopes that it would finally become competitive for attracting commercial development. This effort resulted in a small up, up, uptick in business, but nothing that would transform the neighborhood into the major central business district that elected officials envisioned. The biggest success of this era happened in 2010 when JetBlue agreed to stay in New York City. The company committed to bringing close to 900 jobs to Long Island City, roughly 4% of the minimum number of jobs Amazon has committed to creating, and elected officials were ecstatic. It's also important to note that JetBlue received both as-of-right benefits and discretionary tax incentives to remain in the five boroughs at that time. Now, a decade later, we have a commitment that will bring tens of thousands of new opportunities in a range of fields, from tech, legal, and advertising to administrative and custodial, and at a time when half the jobs in America pay less than $19 an hour, or roughly $39,500 a year, the average salary of new jobs created at the headquarters will be $150,000. 
Amazon is offering more than just jobs. These are real opportunities for New York City families. Better Futures for More New Yorkers was the impetus for responding to Amazon search for its new headquarters, which was issued in September of 2017. A month later, New York, along with 237 other cities across North America, submitted a formal proposal for Amazon's new headquarters. Submitted with ESD, this bid made the case for New York City and leaned into our deep talent pool, unmatched quality of life, and growing tech sector. We stressed that no other city could offer what we could. More Fortune 500 companies than any other North American city, 105 institutions of higher learning, and some of the most diverse neighborhoods on the planet. We didn't just make a pitch for jobs. We shared our values and made sure Amazon understood them. In the press release EDC issued announcing that the proposal had been submitted, we cited that four business districts had been identified that could serve as a future home for Amazon. Long Island City, Midtown West, the Brooklyn Tech Triangle, and Lower Manhattan. In September, prior to submitting the bid, the city issued an RFEI to solicit site ideas and information regarding space, programs, and other assets to include in the proposal. This generated more than two dozen responses from across the city. That same press release also include a included a letter signed by more than 200 leaders across New York City, including seven elected officials, 70 elected officials affirming support for the project. Before we submitted our proposal to Amazon, city, state, and federal elected officials who represented the four neighborhoods in the bid were invited to participate in briefings on the project. In these briefings, we explained that the four sites chosen were based on specific criteria, including phase one readiness, expansion potential, and proximity to transit. The bid was out, and so it seems was New York City from the running. CNN reported that Atlanta had two to one odds of winning the competition, with Philadelphia and Boston trailing a distant second and third. City Lab put its money on Chicago and Dallas, and the New York Times, our own hometown paper said that Denver was the only viable option for its new headquarters. But in January of 2018, Amazon announced its short list of 20 cities for its second headquarters, which included New York. In April of 2018, Amazon came to New York, New York as part of its ongoing tour of finalist cities. During this brief visit, we, saw, we told the company about our workforce, creativity, and ability to deliver on ambitious projects. There were site visits as well as conversations about our tech ecosystem, possible academic partnerships, and public realm improvements. Following the visit, Amazon began to narrow its focus to New York. In July, when it became clear that we were a serious contender, we continued to show the company everything the city had to offer. This included hosting another round of site tours, having in-depth conversations about talent, and ironing out details on timelines. It's important to highlight that several, several city sites and multiple locations were still on the table until the fall. In late October, discussions with the company advanced rapidly. This, of course, culminated on November 13, when the mayor and governor announced that Amazon had selected New York City. According to a Quinnipiac poll released last week, most New Yorkers are excited that Amazon's new headquarters will be built here. The poll shows that New Yorkers overwhelmingly support the company's decision to come to Long Island City by a more than two to one margin. But we've also heard that New Yorkers are concerned that they will not be adequately represented in the process to bring Amazon here, and they have questions about the deal. From the start, the city played an integral, integral role in developing the bid with the state. Our first priority was, and remains, to ensure that this deal gives thousands of New Yorkers a chance to participate in the tech sector, and will strengthen our economic foundation for decades. This is why we set up the newly formed Community Advisory Committee to shape how this project is developed. In close coordination with ESD, and EDC, this body will be able to advise on the headquarters design, infrastructure investment, investments, workforce programming, and more. Amazon's headquarters will be set up through a general project plan, or GPP. This is tool is triggered by state involvement and has historically been used for large-scale economic development projects. I would like to make two important points about a GPP. First, the GPP process is the vehicle that has delivered some of our most successful economic development projects from turning a dilapidated swath of the East River waterfront into Brooklyn Bridge Park to revitalizing a dangerous Times Square into the iconic crossroads of the world that it is today, to redeveloping the former industrial waterfront property along the East River into Queens West. And second, this tool likely would have been utilized anywhere in New York the company wanted to move. Albany, Buffalo, Syracuse, and Westchester all submitted bids for the new headquarters. And if any of them had won, a GPP likely would have been used. This is not new, unique to New York City. I now want to talk about our agreement with Amazon. 
Contrary to counter narratives reported in the press, New York City did not offer a single dollar of discretionary incentives to Amazon. Even before the bid was submitted, the mayor said we would not offer any financial incentives from the city, and we upheld this promise. We did this even though almost every other city in the running put millions, and in some cases, billions of dollars on the table. We believe upholding commitments like these shows the administration's real values. The numbers that have been attributed to incentives the city put on the table are as of right, which are available to any business that meets pre-qualified state criteria that are available under state law. In this case, these are as of right incentives that are available to any company locating or building commercial real estate outside the core of Manhattan. These were deliberately created by the state to spur job growth in the outer boroughs and make jobs more accessible and available to all New Yorkers. The state did provide an incentives package to Amazon, but one that was ultimately worth far less than what was offered by other cities crowned as front, front runners. This includes Montgomery County, Maryland, which offered $170,000 per job, Newark, just across the river, which offered $140,000 per job, and Philadelphia, which offered $112,000 per job. New York State offered close to 50% less than Philadelphia per job created. Over the next 25 years, New York City will receive over $13.5 billion in tax returns, and New York State will receive $14 billion. This allows the city and state to see an unbelievable nine to one return on investment. This is the highest return the state has ever seen for an economic development project. Moreover, because of New York's higher local tax rate, the city and state will collect at least $6.8 billion more in revenue than Virginia, the other municipality where Amazon is building a new headquarters. This is despite being promised the same number of jobs over the next 10 years. Increased tax revenue isn't just a nice to have. It's fuel for funding progressive policies, including improving our public school systems, increasing our housing stock, and shoring up our social services. We can't be a leader in implementing forward-thinking ideas if we have no way to pay for them. As the head of the Economic Development Corporation, it is my job to make sure that no city mayor ever again has to weigh whether to keep police on the streets or our daycare centers open. If we don't internalize the lessons of the past, we run the risk of reliving these tough times. And for my own children and every child in New York City, this is not a risk we should be willing to take. The Amazon Agreement substantially mitigates this risk. It will create incredible job opportunities for New Yorkers of all backgrounds, shore up our lagging infrastructure, and help Long Island City realize its full potential as a thriving business hub. Thank you for your time this morning and for your interest in this critically important topic. I'll now answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you, James. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to allow Amazon. Do you want, would you like to read your statement now? Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, me. Mr. Houseman. And and again, I want you to be able to say whatever you need to say. But also, you know, I think probably the most important part today is the question and answer is between uh, you all and us. So if there are things that you don't think are absolutely necessary uh, to say in your statement, great. If you want to read it all, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, so thank you very much. Great. No. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Vallone, City Council Member Van Bramer, and members of the City Council for inviting us here today. I am Brian Huseman, Vice President of Public Policy at Amazon, and I'm joined by Holly Sullivan, our Head of Worldwide Economic Development. Amazon's mission is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, and our company philosophy is firmly rooted in working backwards from what customers want. And we do this by continuously innovating to provide customers better service, more selection, and lower prices, and we apply that approach across all areas of our business. Many people were surprised to learn that we already have thousands of employees in New York City across our retail operations and web services team. And we're now thrilled to be building a new headquarters in Long Island City and creating at least 25,000 jobs. We will hire residents from Queens, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Staten Island, and across New York State for both technical and non-technical jobs beginning next year. But it's not only about offering employment to New Yorkers. We want to be a good neighbor to the residents of Long Island City and the rest of New York. We are still in the very early stages of this process and tend to be an active participant in the issues facing the community and make community investments that benefit New York City residents. Today, I'd like to discuss three issues. First, why we chose New York and our vision for our Long Island City headquarters. Second, our commitment to workforce development. And third, our commitment to the communities in which our employees will live and work. But most importantly, we're here to listen and to learn New York is one of the greatest cities in the world, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be a contributing part of its fabric. 
So first, let me talk about why we chose Long Island City and our vision. As you know, last month we announced New York City and Arlington, Virginia as the locations for our new headquarters. We'll create five, uh, more than 50,000 jobs and invest more than $5 billion across those two headquarters joining uh, our Seattle headquarters. Our investments in each new headquarters will spur the creation of tens of thousands of additional jobs in the surrounding communities. And we chose New York City for our headquarters because it's a diverse, innovative city that can attract great talent locally and from around the world. Long Island City, Queens, and New York as a whole are home to a robust network of diverse talent that can be tapped on day one and provide an unrivaled opportunity to create a long-term talent pipeline, especially through our education and job training partnerships. But we don't see this just as an investment. We've made specific commitments already, and we will be joining with our neighbors to advocate for the future of Long Island City. Specifically, as part of our commitment to Long Island City, Amazon will provide more than 500,000 square feet for a public school, workforce development and training space focused on community recruitment, public open space at the public development site, light manufacturing space, community facility use and artist workspace, art and tech accelerator space, pre-built incubator space, business incubator space, and public open space at the private development site. But we also want to talk about the investment Amazon is making. New York and Long Island City will benefit from more than 25,000 and up to 40,000 full-time high-paying jobs approximately $2.5 billion in Amazon investment, and 4 million square feet of energy efficient office space with an opportunity to expand to 8 million square feet. The economic benefits to New Yorkers are also unprecedented. It's expected that our headquarters will generate $186 billion in economic activity for New York State over the next 25 years, and that includes $14 billion in tax payments to the state and $13 billion in tax payments to the city. As indicated in our Memorandum of Understanding, Amazon will receive performance-based direct incentives of $1.525 billion based on the company creating 25,000 jobs. This means that Amazon will not receive any incentives until we create jobs and occupy buildings here. To be clear, if we do not create jobs in the city, we will not receive the listed incentives. In addition, the state can recapture the grant funds if we don't hire and retain the amount of jobs indicated in our hiring timeline. Amazon's property taxes on the development site will help fund local infrastructure improvements in Long Island City through a pilot or a payment in lieu of tax program that will include public input. And that's in addition to all the other space Amazon has agreed uh, to donate. We believe that both our employees and the community will benefit from being stitched into the fabric of the neighborhood where amenities are open to everyone. This is our vision for the Long Island City waterfront. And this headquarters will expand our already significant presence in New York City, where we currently have over 5,000 employees. And this year, we launched a fulfillment center in Staten Island. This $100 million facility employs over 2,500 people who make an average of $17.50 to $23 per hour and receive world-class benefits, including health care, <coughs> parental leave, and access to our career choice educational benefits. And as many of you know already, earlier this year, we announced our nationwide commitment to increase our employees' minimum wage to $15 per hour, which went into effect last month. We already know that New York City is an amazing place to hire talent, not just tech talent, but skilled laborers for all types of jobs. And we look forward to our headquarters bringing even more New Yorkers into the Amazon workforce. Second, I'd like to talk about our commitment to workforce development. We, uh, Amazon has a legacy of customer obsession and a rich culture of innovation, and we're taking that same inventive approach to cultivating our workforce and envisioning what it looks like 10, 15, and 20 years down the road. As part of this effort, we are strongly committed to workforce development programs that provide individuals with the skill and education necessary to take on the jobs of today and tomorrow. We want to work hand in hand with the community to make sure economic development uplifts everyone. We're going to embark on robust workforce development efforts. Along with the city and the state, we've agreed to make an initial $5 million investment to fund workforce development initiatives here. We're going to collaborate with the city and the state over the next 10 years, and these programs are going to impact thousands of students and workers. And just as a couple of examples, these initiatives will include New York City-based technology training programs. We're going to work with New York City Housing Authority residents. We're going to recruit and interview students. I provide 
provide internships, and we're gonna ho hold semi-annual recruiting events with residents of the Queensbridge houses. But we are here for the long term. We want to immediately hire New Yorkers and build a pipeline of talent to provide employment opportunities to residents of all educational and life backgrounds. We want to work with the city, the state, with you all, with local elected officials in the local community through the Community Advisory Committee process, which will allow the public an opportunity to provide input on infrastructure and workforce development needs. At Amazon, we listen to our local communities and customers, and we work backwards from their, from their needs to accomplish our objectives, and we want to do the same with Long Island City, our new Long Island City neighbors. Um, one great example of Amazon's commitment to workforce development is our career choice program, which I can go into more detail about, but it's an upskilling program to provide our workers with in-demand and high-paying jobs. And we know firsthand that uh, providing and preparing associates for those in-demand opportunities is key because the skills gap is a major challenge for our country's workforce. And we look forward to partnering with our Long Island City communities on similar efforts. Finally, let me talk about our commitment to the community. We have long been committed to the communities where our employees live and work. And you may not know this, but we're a bit different from most companies. So instead of offering free lunches and locating in suburban campuses, we take steps to encourage our employees to go out and be part of the community. We prefer urban campuses. And we actually only have on-site food services that serve just uh, a portion and a small percentage of our workforce so our employees can frequent local restaurants and retail establishments. And we try to connect to the community by design. We're also diving deeper than ever to provide innovative and unique ways to support communities around the world. We're particularly focused on our neighbors in immediate needs, including families fighting homelessness, hunger, and natural disasters. And we're focused on the next generation, on providing opportunities for STEM, science, technology, education, and math education, and computer science. We've recently launched our Amazon Future Engineer, or AFE program, which, a, which is a comprehensive childhood to career program. And from our announcement last month, over 34 New York City schools have committed to launch that program next year. While we have already agreed to significant community engagement commitments, we look forward to working with community residents and leaders to determine how best to implement those commitments. I want every member of the city council here today and leaders from across the city to know that our doors are always open. We want to meet with you and engage in meaningful dialogue. In, in some, I want to express our commitment to Long Island City and all of New York. We will offer well-paying jobs to Queens and New York City residents. We also are committed to robust workforce development programs and to engaging on programs that help the community. We are humbled and grateful to be a part of the next chapter of New York City's great history. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Houston. I, I want to thank everyone who came here today uh, for being respectful um, during this. I know people are very, very passionate, uh, and we appreciate uh, you all being here. We look forward to having a public forum where everyone is allowed to uh, have their voices be heard, and we're really glad that you are here today. Um, so I want to thank you all for letting us have this testimony uh, be read, and I look forward to uh, council members asking questions. Again, if you all have questions who are here in the balcony or down here, we want you to, to tweet them so that we can ask uh, some of those questions. They'll be running up on the screen. And again, I want to thank you all um, for, uh, you know, for working with us. So uh, I want to get to uh, President uh, Patchett uh, first. Um, you know, the mayor and governor uh, have said since they are elected officials, the state's general project plan process is good enough. Okay, so folks, folks, so that's just going to lead to being cleared. We'd really like you to be part of this. Folks, I'm going to give, folks, this folks. This is the last. Right. Folks, I'm going to give one more. I'm going to, folks, I'm going to. 
Hey, please, everyone, please. I'm gonna Ladies give. Gentlemen. I'm gonna give one more warning. One more warning. Last one. This is the last warning. This is the last warning. Final warning. I don't want to have to do this. I don't want to have to do this. Come on, let's 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 get through the rest of this hearing. Your okay, voices so, are being heard. So that's that's the final warning. Come on, we're not in sixth grade. Let's let's be able to handle ourselves and hear this. This is so critical to hear the testimony, hear the questions. You deserve to be heard. You don't deserve to be brought out of here with the officers. So we don't want that to happen. The speaker has been very generous in that. Let's give our respect and hear the questions. The council members are fighting for your your concerns. Speaker, let's go. So, so next time, next time it happens, we have to do it because we have a long day today and Very people want to ask questions. So, one more time. That's it. Okay. So, uh, James, uh, the mayor and the governor uh, said since they are elected officials, the state's general project plan process is good enough that they are duly elected. But we have had ULERP in place since 1975 for a reason. We are not in the business of corporate welfare here at the council, and we answer to the people of New York City. So again, your testimony, uh, you actually, if I can find it here, when you were reading your testimony, you left out a line that you didn't read. You, when, you, you left you, out a few lines you, asked you didn't me, read. You asked me to but, but specifically on ULERP, when you, were when you were reading about ULERP, so where you said, uh, this is not unique to New York City, and then the, the end of the sentence, which wasn't read, is in, in, this is by no means an attempt to deliberately circumvent the Euler process. So, former Deputy Mayor Dan Doktoroff was asked, uh, after he left city government, he was asked about the Euler process being avoided for Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he said, that was his project. He championed that project when he was deputy mayor. And he said, if I had to do it over again, I would bring Atlantic Yards through ULERP mm -hmm. because it's the right process to get community buy-in mm -hmm. and the public review is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't agree with Dan Doctoroff on everything, mm -hmm. but I thought that was an interesting comment. So I would, I would like to understand why it was important for the city and the state to facilitate the subverting of the public review process as it relates to land use in New York City and for this project. Do you think it's a public benefit to offer a way to avoid local oversight? Thank you for the question. Uh, your team asked me to shorten my testimony, so I made a number of edits beforehand. Um, <clears throat> took out a number of paragraphs. Um, so just, to answer your answer your question, uh, the the GPP is a tool that is available under state law. It's part of the UDC Act. Uh, you know, I didn't write the UDC Act, but I do understand the benefits of having the general project plan process, which is available to do more comprehensive planning, and it's a it is a more powerful tool than ULERP for certain projects, which is why it was used in Times Square. I've certainly, heard, I think it was in his book that he said that, um, that I've seen it, and he may have said it in interviews as well. Uh, and we certainly need to take lessons from Atlantic Yards. I think the lessons that we've taken from Atlantic Yards and that we certainly hear is the importance of community input, the importance of genuinely involving people in the way the project ultimately looks. That's why we set up the Community Advisory Committee. That's why there are more than 40 members of it, which represent local officials, uh, lo local officials, uh, community members, all five borough presidents. It's important that this be a comprehensive process to help shape what we ultimately happens here. So what's the threshold to avoid ULERP? Mm -hmm. So I think the, it's in order to have it make sense to do a GPP, the city and the state have to be working closely together for a shared policy goal where the GPP is the only practical policy tool that is available that is, can achieve the objective. And the community in input also has to be a part of it as Deputy Mayor Dr. Off pointed you out. You didn't answer the question. What's the threshold when local land use review should be overrided? Well, How does a city determine what that threshold is? When do we decide that we avoid ULERP and we go outside of public review? 
Uh, well, my response to that is what I said. In this case, we were trying to create 25,000 jobs and do the best deal we could for But what if we were going to create 8,000 jobs? Mm -hmm. So again, when the city and state are is working- Is 25,000 jobs a threshold? Uh, I believe the outcomes that we've seen in other examples like Brooklyn Bridge Park and Times Square certainly warranted it. Do you, I mean, do you think that we shouldn't have taken advantage of a GPP in Times Square to totally change the face of that district? I mean, if we went back to the way it was before the GPP, uh, I don't think anyone would be happy with it. These are, in some ways, metaphysical questions that I'm not sure we can answer uh, today about Times Square in the 1990s. Um, <laughs> Do you think it's a benefit to Amazon to offer a way to avoid, do you think it's a benefit to Amazon, a public benefit, are we offering them a public benefit to avoid local oversight and avoid the Euler process? Are they receiving a benefit? I think what we were fundamentally focused on was getting the jobs here. Uh, I, I believe that it was necessary to achieve that and I believe it's a totally appropriate tool. Um, when did we decide we were avoiding ULERP? This was a deal that you worked on with ESD. When was the decision made that there would be no ULERP? Yep. From the outset, from the, from the offering, from the very beginning, yep. or was there a certain point in the process that that decision was made? We put tens of millions of square feet of space on the table across the city in four different neighborhoods. Many of them were, as of right, and would have required, required no public approvals. So the, the notion that they would even require public approvals uh, for any land use matters was not determined until the very end of the process. Well, in, in one of the documents, uh, I believe this is the MOU, under land use and zoning support, the RFP response, it says ESD can override local zoning, offer tax subsidies while holding a title to a property and provide lower cost financing or grants to economic development projects. So it seems like it was from the outset the decision was made. So that was, so th just to step back, this was a state-led response to the proposal. You weren't it, equal partners. It, just to be clear, it was, it was, it was a, because it, in, it was not just New York City, it was New York City, Westchester County, and Long Island in that proposal. They included, as to the best of my knowledge, the same information in all of the responses for New York State, which included Buffalo, Albany, Syracuse. Um, they provided their general language. That the fact that they m said it as was a tool that they had available did not mean at that time, by any means, that it had been determined that it would be used. So whose interest did you feel like you were representing in negotiating this deal? 100% the people of New York City. Every day when I come to do my job, <laughs> every day when I come to do my job, I have no one's interest in mind but the uh, people who live in New York City. I fundamentally believe that this is a good deal for New York City or I wouldn't be sitting here today. You, asked, you said I should be proud to testify today. I am proud to testify today. I think we've seen that New Yorkers more than two to one believe that we did our job right. You live by the poll, you die by the poll. I mean, the polls said Hillary Clinton was going to be president. I wish they were right. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I would go off of one poll uh, based on. Not going off of one poll, Speaker. I'm just saying I fundamentally did that, and I think New Yorkers have agree with me. I'm not sure that's true, and that's why, I mean, I don't know if that's true. Okay. Um, I think it's. Uh, I'm just I, telling you genuinely. You asked the question, did I represent the best interests of New Yorkers or someone else? No, no, There's I said whose interest here other than I that said I whose, I said whose interest in were I serving? Yes. The people of New York City, and I think there's evidence of that. So I think th there are many parts of this deal which clearly uh, people do not feel that the interests of the city are being served when you avoid the public review process, which we work with you on all the time, on many projects, mm -hmm. many projects we work with you on, and it's a negotiated deal mm -hmm. where community input is baked into that deal and we get to a good result. Absolutely. And so that's not happening here. Okay. And it's hard, I think, for the public, and it's hard for us as elected officials to understand why that is the case mm -hmm. for why that's not the case for so many applications that come to us, but for a trillion dollar multinational corporate company, they get this treatment. So you know, Amazon made a decision to come to New York City 29 days ago. 
We have an eight-page MOU outlining general terms. That's not the finish line, it's just the starting line. We have a lot of work to do together. That's why we set up a community process. We are fully committed to community engagement as a part of this. It has to be a part of it. That's what Deputy Mayor Doctoroff said, I agree with you. Um, we encourage the council to participate in that process. I don't think abdicating responsibility for the level of community responsibility, the level of community involvement is a solution here. I think we need to get to a successful finish line and I know we have been great partners in the past. I recognize your concerns about this. We want to work together to make this a good outcome for New York City. I by the way, not that I should be quoting the polls since, uh, again, I said you live by the poll, you die by the poll, but the polls did not support the financial incentives. The polls overwhelmingly were against the financial incentives. Not true. How would you respond to that since you quoted the poll? I actually, well, I mean, the poll actually was split on financial incentives. It was just about even support for, I mean, just that's true. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I have a question for Amazon, uh, Mr. Houseman. Uh, would you have not come here if you had to go through ULERP? Would you have not come to New York City? So actually, I'll answer that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Ms. Sullivan, um, thank Holly you. Sullivan. Um, so when we were looking at um, different options and real estate options and quite frankly, different locations, there were 20 locations in the, in the finalists for this project. Um, we're not a developer, we're a company, and our, our primary reason for doing this project is really the job creation. So as soon as we can get a development plan approved, we can start hiring great New Yorkers for, for those jobs. So when we were speaking with the city and the state, one of our priorities is how can we develop a comprehensive plan? This is a large project that takes into account the open space, the land use planning, also the environmental impacts um, and the community engagement and, um, and looking at the general project plan, that was the process that would actually be able to meet our timeline and then also have the community engagement. And my understanding is it's a, you know, a nine to 12 month process. We're, we're still learning, it's very early. We have no development plans. Um, that's one of the reasons we're here today. We really do wanna listen. We wanna engage with the community and make sure that we're making the right decisions as we move forward. So um, I'm gonna ask again, if, if you had to go through ULERP, would you not have come to New York City? I'm not sure, that's, you know, that's a hypothetical. That, um, no, it's you know, not hypothetical. It, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I can answer that today. I, mean, I, I think our vision is we're going through the general project plan, um, and, unless something changes. Uh, but we feel that land use decisions. Well, just, uh, just to be clear, on circumventing ULERP, Mayor de Blasio said, quote, Amazon needed a certain amount of certainty which presumably ULERP could not provide. And then uh, ESD President uh, Patchett went even further by saying Amazon would quote, would have just gone somewhere else definitively. But you're not saying that. You're not saying that you would go somewhere else definitively if you had to avoid ULERP, but that's what President Patchett said about the ULERP process. So as Holly mentioned, our goal is to uh, hire uh, New Yorkers uh, quickly, and the GPP is the best uh, avenue um, from what we have learned from the city and state to meet that timeline. Uh, Mr. Houseman, how would you define, what does being a good neighbor mean to you? Yeah. We, uh, I, think I would uh, say that we take the same approach as we, uh, that we do with our customers, as we want to do with our neighbors, with the uh, communities in which our employees live and work, which is we want to listen to them, we want to hear what their needs are, and we want to work backwards from that. Uh, we have started to meet with community groups. Uh, we're excited to be here today to, to listen and to learn uh, from you all. We want to give back to the community, uh, and we want our employees uh, to become a part of, of the fabric of our new Long Island City neighborhood. Do you think clearly from the opposition and the anger that we've seen from the residents of Western Queens that it is a good way to come to New York City and be a good neighbor to avoid the land use process? Well, uh, my understanding is that with the GP process, there will be opportunity for public input. Whoever advised you of that, <laughs> whoever advised you of that, took this project from being a complicated project to an extraordinarily problematic project. So I think there would be almost universal disagreement that that's not how we do things. And whoever advised you that that community advisory committee, which has no weight of law, 
behind it, has nothing binding behind it, that that is the way to be a good neighbor, advise you in a very problematic way. Amazon is a $1 trillion company. Is that accurate? You're approximately valued at a trillion dollars? I think it's close to that, yeah. Close to that. So why should we give you this money? So these incentives, um, um, they're performance-based, which means that we will not receive any money until we create jobs and make these investments. But you're worth a trillion dollars. Why do you need our $3 billion when we have crumbling subways, crumbling public housing, people without health care, <laughs> public schools that are overcrowding? Why, why, do you need, why do you need our $3 billion? This project is going to provide over $186 billion in positive economic impact to the state over the next 25 years. That includes over $14 billion in additional tax payments. That to the analysis was done by someone who was hired by the state of New York and not by neutral third party academics or companies that could provide that economic analysis. The, the, what you're citing was done by people who were hired to do that on behalf of this project. It wasn't done by a neutral third party. So why do you need our, if you're worth a trillion dollars, why do you need our $3 billion? We believe this project will be a positive economic impact for the city and the state. We're here to create jobs uh, in not only our 25,000 direct jobs, but the thousands of indirect jobs that will result from this. Would you be willing to go through ULERP? Not at this uh, process. I believe we are, uh, you know, we are proceeding with the GPP plan. So you're saying no to the community who you want to be neighbors with. You're saying no to the city council and the local city council member. You're saying no, you won't go through ULERP. I don't think that's an option at this time. It is an option. <laughs> you're saying no to it. Okay. So um, I've assume, I assume you visited Long Island City, the site? Yes. yes. Uh, did you take the 7 train to get there? I've taken the 7, the N, and I've taken multiple, and the ferry. So why do you need a helipad? <clears throat> yeah. So the, um, just to be very clear, the Amazon will be paying for the helipad. There will not be city or state taxpayers. I would hope so. For that. I mean, no, we, why do you need a helipad? Yeah, as we were, we were trying to have a very comprehensive agreement. We were trying to look out in the future and anticipate what future needs might be. And so we were examining potential safety or security issues. In the interest of transparency, we wanted to put this provision in the MOU, but we also wanted to make sure that it would not be a disturbance to the neighborhood or to the residents. So there are provisions in the MOU that limit the number of landings to a maximum of 120 per year and also ensure that any helicopters don't fly over the neighborhood but would fly over the water or the development site. Do you realize how out of touch that seems <laughs> for the average New Yorker? I mean, that's a very out of touch. People, we have six million people who take the subways every day, two million people who take the buses, they're crumbling. To have a helipad uh, be part of this is, I mean, it's crazy. So your senior vice president, Jay Carney, said that incentives did not drive this process for you. <clears throat> that's what he said publicly. Is that true? So talent was the major driver, and that's why we're very excited to locate here in New York. As you all know, New York has an amazing uh, talent pool, and we're ready and eager to start hiring uh, New Yorkers. But incentives were a factor in our decision. But they didn't, your senior vice president, Jay Carney, said they didn't drive the process. Is that true? So talent was the key driver, but in fact, incentives were also a factor. Would you be willing to give up some of those incentives so they could go to some of the other things we've talked about? So again, our project is going to have a positive economic impact, and we're only going to receive the incentives after we create these jobs uh, and make these investments. We're not getting straight answers. Does the word monopoly bother you? It, because do you think monopolistic behavior helps or hurts us as a society? Well, monopolistic behavior is against the competition laws. But if you're talking about, uh, if you have a question, uh, you know, for Amazon, our goals are to lower prices and provide better convenience and selection for our customers, which match exactly what the competition laws are designed to do. Would you sign a neutrality agreement for the workers who end up working on site? Uh, in any of the places in New York City so that they could organize and uh, be part of a labor union? 
Would the, would the company be willing to sign a neutrality agreement? So we definitely respect employees' right to choose whether to join or to not join a union. But that's not what we're hearing is happening on Staten Island, where you just located a, 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 a distribution center. People are saying that they're not being treated fairly and adequately, the workers there. And, yeah. they, and it was announced that they're going to start organizing. Will Amazon not interfere with those workers being able to organize and be part of a union? Absolutely. We respect an employee's right to choose. But I also want to talk about our Stand Not Only Fulfillment Center, where we have over 2,500 employees. Those are good, high-paying jobs. Uh, the employees make between $17.50 to $23 per hour. That's on top of our world-class benefits, including uh, health care. We have the same egalitarian parental leave policies in our fulfillment centers as we do with our executive workers. I'm very proud of those jobs, and I would love for you all to come to that fulfillment center and talk with the workers yourself. Does, 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 um, does, does Amazon support the Trump administration's policies on immigration? Amazon has a very strong and positive uh, record on immigration. We advocate, we file in the legal system on behalf of DACA and Dreamers and green card reform. What is Amazon's relationship with ICE? So I think you're referring to our recognition technology, which is a technology that matches images with uh, customers. Uh, you're a contractor with ICE. Data, database. So we provide our, that recognition service to a variety of government agencies, and we think that uh, <coughs> government should have the best available technology. Okay. So um, I want to. Uh, I want to. Uh, I have a couple more questions, and I want to go to my colleagues, the chair, and then Councilman Van Bramer and other folks uh, that have uh, questions here. Um, so, for for President Patchett, uh, we have been told that this deal is just the start of the process; that the MOU is not the final deal. Is that correct? Yes. So, does that mean the administration will walk away from the deal if Amazon does not deliver? How do you define deliver? What I, so what we will do is we'll take the commitments that are a part of the MOU and other commitments that are determined in partnership with the community and put them into legal documents with the company, which we still have yet to even begin drafting. And if they fail to deliver on those benefits, they won't receive a dime of the subsidy. And they will also be subject to significant financial penalties and also the ability to ultimately take the properties back. So as part of the, this uh, deal that was announced, and I'm sure Councilman Van Bramer is going to go more specifically into this, mm -hmm. the MOU uh, notes that the general project plan will include Plaxel Site C, which Amazon does not need for their campus. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. We also just found out yesterday that ESD and EDC, and your name is on the document, uh, James, that EDC agreed to let Pac Plaxel quadruple the amount of commercial floor area they could build on that site and also build residential. Today it's a manufacturing district. They cannot build, build housing today given the current zoning. So not only is Plaxel getting Amazon as a tenant uh, on land they own, they are also getting a windfall in the form of a huge upzoning without having to lift a finger and work with the city council. And to make matters worse, the MOU spells out in detail what plaques can build. So ESD and EDC have entered into an MOU with a private company, private property owner, to allow them to build close to 800,000 square feet. That's an office building with roughly the same floor area as the Chrysler building. And it's not gonna go through ULERP, it was tied into this site. Would you be willing to commit to at least letting this project go through ULERP instead of overriding zoning for one private property owner? So, as, as I know you're aware, uh, Mr. Speaker, we originally, those were all part of a single public approval process. And they were going to go through ULERP. And we felt that it made, still made sense to keep them as part of a single approval process. The only change that we made was to you're right, increase the commercial FAR. We did not adjust the residential FAR because it made sense to have commercial next to commercial. Do you consider that Plaxel's getting a public benefit by not having to go through ULERP? You know, as I said before, it made planning sense to us to include it as part of a single uh, approval process. Does any of this need to be approved by the Public Authorities Control Board? Any, yeah. of this, any part of this deal? Yes. Which part? 
the, the capital grants, which is five hundred and five hundred million dollars for uh, Amazon to build their building. Certainly, the land use aspects in the general project plan do. That's the only part, the land uh, use aspects, not, not the capital grants aspect. Um, um, uh, the so the general project plan does, and certain elements of the incentives do as well. They all need to go through the state budget. Uh, I'm going to have some further questions, but I want to turn it over to Chair Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have been joined by Council Members Cornegie, Richards. <clears throat> See? Pause is good. Cornegie, Richards, Barron, Moyer, and Rosenthal. We will have questions from the Council Members at this point after my comments and Council Member Van Bramer. The list at this is Council Members Lander, Koo, Powers, Williams, Levine, Menchaca. Richards, Barron, Rivera, Cornegie, and Adams, and that's why uh, we will have a four-minute clock on that. So the speaker touched many of the topics that are here, and, and the daunting task for everyone trying to listen and follow through, a lot of these documents were given to us yesterday. So in my humble opinion, I kind of summarized the different areas that I believe the council members are going to jump into and where the subsequent hearings are going to go. So where we started off with the speaker was understanding the deal which I think is what this is really the focus of today. Then there's the memorandum of understanding, or understanding the memorandum of understanding, mm -hmm. the tax incentives and the cap grants and the financial implications, the 25,000 jobs that we're going to discuss. Council members Rosenthal, Barron, and Landers have all talked about the clawback provisions and the recapture of grant funds if certain standards aren't met. I'm sure those council members will address that. There's the workforce development and working with the local communities and what guarantees we can give Long Island City and Council Member Van Bramer is going to go over that. The infrastructure fund itself and what type of community involvement engagement there's going to be and the impact on the retail, the homeowners, the residents, the businesses and the relationships with those local entities and the labor practice with our great unions. To me, those are the subcategories of this monumental transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the tweets and some of the questions were, there's a lot of acronyms being thrown around, a lot of terms that people were hearing for the first time. So I'm just going to give a one paragraph description of this ULERP and GPP that we keep hearing about so we can understand what it is that the fight is over. Mm -hmm. So the city has a standardized process for reviewing land use applications. That is what the speaker has been fighting for, what the council is fighting for. It's called the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, and that's how we get the ULERP acronym. It's a public process that includes certification from the Department of City Planning and review by our community boards, our borough president, city planning commission, and the city council that's sitting here today. The CPC and the City Council both have the power to disapprove or modify an application. During the negotiations with Amazon, the parties decided to circumvent that and go through a state process that supersedes local control instead. The parties committed to adopting, and that's what you were hearing, this GPP, which is a general protection plan, which is a state development process governed by the Urban Development Corporation Act, both of which uh, President Patchett and Speaker Johnson were talking about. And, and we as a council will always fight for our real estate and our UERP and our community's <coughs> involvement in that. And that's what the basis really of today's hearing. And you mentioned the general project plan, and it's one that we obviously are not part of. The, who has ultimate control over that? Sure, so the general project plan uh, is a state process led by the state, um, but this is a joint city-state partnership. So we'll be working very closely with them. Uh, well, the problem is this, this part of the city is not part of that plan. So who's, which part of the city will be part of that process? Well, we very much want the city council to be a part of this process. Uh, ultimately, there are a huge number of decisions that are still to be made uh, in terms of the, what specifically will happen on the site. And you know, that is very much a part of what ULERP is about. There are also decisions to be made about infrastructure investments uh, that will be necessary in the community and the way that workforce development will happen with the company. All three of those have an enormous amount of work to be done together. And how do we able to get those three aspects, which is such a big part of everyone today, to become to a binding agreement so that we can have some guarantees mm -hmm. to give to the community? That not, it's not just sounds good, but it's actually gonna happen. Right, so you know, we're absolutely, the city is responsible for the infrastructure working group, most specifically, and we're absolutely prepared to work with the council come 
to come and the local community to come. But those to are advisory, aren't they? Well, but ultimately, we intend to come to an agreement, a, a financial commitment, which will be binding about what are the necessary levels of infrastructure investment in, needed in the community. And I think that's the difficulty you'll hear from all the groups from from the council members that there's this this lack of guarantee that the ability to tell New York City and Long Island City and Queens that, yes, it sounds great, it's like a top-heavy deal, it's all these wonderful things happening, but the basic building blocks, the foundation to get to there is what we're trying to flush out. And Absolutely. Well, ultimately, we're basically saying, trust us, it's going to be wonderful. We, we need to hear that there will be a direct link with the residents of Queensbridge and Long Island City and that there will be job workforce that will actually employ New York City residents, not people from Texas and everywhere else. I want to know that X percentage of jobs are going to go to New York City residents. Absolutely. They're nowhere in the, any of the testimony from either Amazon or yourself is telling us, don't worry, New York, 50% of those jobs, 100% of those jobs, 80% of those jobs are going to go to you. Yeah. So how do we respond to that? Those jobs have to go to New Yorkers. That's what this is about. Amazon, from the beginning, uh, focused on talent. They had, we had the most conversations with them about any topic about talent. Uh, we, they met with the uh, heads of uh, our local New York City institutions, including SUNY and CUNY, met with our leading workforce development organizations in the city. Uh, you know, we fundamentally believe that this is the biggest workforce development opportunity of our lifetime. Now, how did we get to the $150,000 figure that we keep saying? So we don't want to make sure it's four people making a billion dollars and everyone else making $15 an hour. How do we know it's the 150000 is going to be an actual number that we can abide by? Chairman, just kind of on your previous point, I just want to be really clear. We want to hire New Yorkers. That's why we're coming here. The talent here will allow us to start to hire uh, New York residents on. And, and I love that you say we want to, but we want to hear we will hire. There's a big difference. We will. We will and hire New Yorkers. We will hire New That's Yorkers. That's a very different statement. <laughs> And now we want to hear the next step is we will hire and there will be X percentage of New Yorkers that are going to be here so I don't have to see all the rest of the country coming into taking over Long Island City. So we're at the very early stages of trying to figure out what business units uh, will be located here in Long Island City. As you know, we just made the, uh, the final decision the day before our public announcement. So we're starting that process of figuring that out. I, so I don't have specific you know, figures for you now. I don't have specific uh, uh, things to tell you. So please, sir, we managed to make it this far. Sir, please, we're getting there, and that's what this is all about. I get the idea. They're, they're so smoke and mirrors. They're not getting into what the plans really are and how they're trying to monopolize. We appreciate everyone's passion. That's exactly why we're here. Mr. Chairman, if I could Mr. also Chair, ask. Please, everyone. So back to the question, and, and that's where the questioning is. To find the jobs, to find the, how do you see the workforce? Who is the workforce, and what are the jobs comprised of? Yeah. So I can uh, tell you, based upon our Seattle headquarters, what our kind of division and types of jobs are. So in Seattle, we have about half technical jobs, and those include things such as software development engineers, and then we have half non-technical jobs. And those are the types of jobs that you would expect in any corporate headquarters, things from HR, you know, from finance. And how are the reception. salaries divided between the technical and the non-technical, and how is the development of the workforce to be obtained those jobs? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're very focused on uh, workforce development and making sure that uh, residents have the skills necessary to obtain all the types of jobs uh, at our headquarters, including our program that, you know, what I mentioned in our testimony that we announced, which is our Amazon Future Engineer Program, which trains and provides inspiration and access to computer science from childhood all the <coughs> way uh, through uh, the, the education process. And we also, I mean, as we said previously, we have over 5,000 um, Amazonians already in New York City, so we have experience and uh, we're, we're still learning. How um, many of those Amazonians are New York City residents? I can get back to you on that question. That's I don't have that off question. the top of my head. We, we need to, to know that. Head. I mean, it's 5,000 is a number. If you're telling me 4,500 of those are New York City residents, those are things the city can start to see yes. those relationships. Absolutely. If they're not, they continue to we'll follow up. We'll follow up with that. So the questioning about Long Island City workforce and Queensbridge and Bishop Taylor and the folks that live there, Councilmember Van Bramer is going to handle those questions. Um, the different segments of this, and there's so much, and that's why you have all these council members with questions. I'm also going to lead to that. The last topic that I'm going to briefly touch 
on, on besides the jobs itself is the infrastructure fund. And I think if we are the Economic Development Committee and we are the members of the committee and the council to fight for that, understanding this infrastructure fund and the use of these hundreds of millions of dollars that are being mentioned yeah. and the control of that funding to guarantee for the local communities how their future today and 15 years from now will be impacted is important to know. And I, I don't think we're, we're seeing enough on that. So I'm going to give an opportunity both to Mr. Pratchett sure. and Amazon to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you know, you know, we're, we're obviously aware of the challenges that Seattle has faced with the growth of Amazon, which were frankly unanticipated. I don't think even Amazon knew the degree to which they were going to grow when they came to Seattle. The advantage here is we have the ability to plan in advance. That's what we are expecting to do over the course of the next few years. We need to think about this together. So th from an infrastructure standpoint, we recognize that, there will, that the community has a lot of needs today. We acknowledge that. The council member, and we have spoken about that many times, he's been very clear about the infrastructure needs in his community, has emphasized those. And you know, we are very excited to work together to identify what are the near-term infrastructure investments that are necessary over the next 10 years to, uh, to accommodate the needs of the neighborhood today. Do we know then, what will be tackled first? What will, will we, what will be tackled first? Out of those capital grants, what, what are the first things that we plan on doing right off the bat? Well, to, to make sure that Long Island City and the residents there know that the city has a plan to take care of that tomorrow. Right, so the, we, we announced our infrastructure working group yesterday. We want the needs to be identified by the community, but we're committed to tackling whatever are the most critical interests issues first. So as those are identified by the community, what happens next? Does the EDC say then, well, okay, we're going to do that? Or yeah, we'll put them into the city's capital budget. Um, and then, the, the, so that's the near-term plan. The long-term plan um, is to recognize that, you know, we, we don't know today every need that we're going to have over the next few decades, but we know that there will be impacts. So we worked to set up a pilot fund, which will set aside a portion of the property taxes paid by the company. $650 million, which can be identified or used by the community in future years to identify the infrastructure projects that are needed. So we've, we have a dual strategy. So is that a guarantee of certain funding that will yes, be set aside? For exactly. It will be set aside into a lockbox fund, which will set up, we will agree during this process in partnership with the community, the mechanism by which it will, those, fund, those projects will be identified, be a community-driven process, similar to the process that was set up for East Midtown, identify priority projects, you know, in 10 years or 15 years that are necessary in addition to the projects we're investing in now so that we know that there will be a set, certain amount of funds set aside for the future to address those issues. And who has say in final control over how those funds are used? So there's going to be a lockbox fund that will be set aside and we're going to rely on the community to determine what should be. Will there be an annual budgetary release of what the funding yeah, will the be? Yeah, the funding can be, will be in, set aside in a fund. It won't even be in the city's Budget will be a separate fund that the community, where the community can identify. Will the, the community advisory groups have the ability to to control and, and give budgetary priorities over how that's going to be done, and the so EDC the, will guarantee that that's what will be done. Yeah, we'll we'll work with the community to identify the particular mechanism. I mean, we the, the funds technically will need to be released by the city or by the EDC, but the the projects and priorities will be identified by the community. And the workforce that's going to go with this, I'd like to hear from, from Amazon. What, how, what is your vision to develop the local workforce to give us those guarantees that you will be the good neighbor and hire someone? We want to see those first hirings come from the people, the good people that live right on the streets that are going to be impacted. What can we tell them today that your plan is to make sure that that person is trained, has a proper workforce development, has a path to that job, and then when that job is there, it's theirs? That's right. We, we want that same thing. We agreed to uh, an, and initial, an initial number of uh, commitments, uh, including an initial $5 million in the Memorandum of Understanding, as well as a few specific programs uh, in the MOU, uh, including working with uh, New York City-based tech and STEM education, working with the Queensbridge uh, houses, working with other NYCHA residents. Um, we want to hear when does that means. happen so does that happen from day is that happening now is that happening tomorrow when does that happen so we're starting to meet with the community residents to hear their needs we 
group, you're going to be active participants in the workforce development uh, subcommittee of the community advisory committee. We want to hear exactly what the needs are for the workers and for the residents uh, of the neighborhood, and then we will develop programs and work with existing programs to make sure that those are addressed. And specifically, Chairman, we have met with Bishop Taylor twice. Um, again, we're, we're very early. Um, we're still trying to make these community connections listen and learn so we can make informed decisions on what, uh, what programs are already available that we can partner with um, the neighborhood on and the community organizations on. But what new, new pioneering uh, programmatic activities can we also develop? Um, and and uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to add one thing to go back on the, the question of the infrastructure fund. I should just emphasize that it is the GPP that allows us to set up this pilot fund for infrastructure. It wouldn't be possible under ULERP. But the pilot programming funding actually would go through city review, but now it's being circumvented to go through state. It allows it to set aside a separate fund for the community to be identified. Otherwise, we just have to go through the regular budget process. So future officials in 20 years would have to determine whether there was a priority for Long Island City versus other neighborhoods. And the, since you brought that up, it says the MOU talks about a three-year project for residents. Three years is not enough. How do we come to three years and how do we give a commitment beyond three years? So, right, so what it says is we... we Please, thank you. Go ahead and put it Thanks. Um, the, the, so there's, there's a three year, some of the, so I think there's a recognition that the needs of the community are gonna change over time. So there are some of, the, some of these are long-term plans, like the workforce development efforts will be training thousands and thousands of New Yorkers over decades. Um, and so we have an initial plan for that, which is we have some money set aside for the first year and we have plans to train thousands of people which specific institutions we're gonna work with, whether it's LaGuardia Community College or um, Urban Upbound or Resettlement or we're gonna work with um, you know, the CUNY institutions citywide, all of those things need to be worked out. I mean, there are a lot of fabulous workforce development providers who have already talked to the company, wanna make sure those are successful. We have, don't have those plans yet. And some of them are specific plans which we say we should start for the first couple of years and then continue to do something that is potentially more impactful. I think the, the notion was, again, to reemphasize, this is just the beginning. We don't have a final set of agreements. We have a framework for an agreement, and we want to work together to make it a really good project for this community. And we hear that, but we want to have a voice in that agreement, and that's why we need, and that's what's not happening. So I'd like to turn over to Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, who will then be filed by Council Member Lander. Thank you very much. Uh, so I just want to start by saying to Mr. Huseman, every time I hear you talk about the five million dollars, my blood boils. You are a trillion dollar corporation and the only dollar figure that the mayor and the governor have secured from you at this point is five million dollars. That is an insult to the people of the city of New York. That isn't on you, because your job is to make money for your company. But it is on the mayor and the governor to protect the people uh, from getting ripped off, and that's called getting ripped off. Now, you've also talked about getting to know the, com the community and getting to know the needs. And look, you all are new here, right? Literally helicoptering in. <laughs> but the mayor and the governor know the needs because they are the mayor and the governor. So I want to talk a little bit about that. The deputy mayor and the mayor uh, have signed on to this deal. So I want to ask you, President Patchett, do you and the mayor support the $500 million capital grant in this deal, which will help pay Jeff Bezos to build these buildings? So the mayor from the very beginning said the city was not going to offer any discretionary incentives. That's not the question. The, no, we're the fiduciaries of the city. Do you support, does the mayor support the $500 million capital grant which will reimburse Jeff Bezos to build this building? We feel very good about the deal that we negotiated for New York City residents to get the 25,000 jobs here. The state has their own prerogative to make their decisions but about you signed, the But the budget. mayor signed on to the deal. So just answer the question. Mm -hmm. President Patrick, you know I have a great deal of respect for you. All I'm asking you is answer the question. Do you support the $500 million capital grant to reimburse the richest man in the world to build his headquarters? <laughs> we support the state's partnership in bringing Amazon to New York City. You're not answering the question. Over to Amazon. Does Jeff Bezos 
And I, I don't begrudge the man his wealth, but he's worth $75 billion. Your company is a trillion dollar company. Do you need $500 million to build the building? So again, um, we will not receive any incentives until we create the jobs and make the investments. And there's gonna be a tremendous positive economic impact uh, for this city and for this state. I understand you, that was completely non-responsive to the question. Um, let me try and be a little bit more direct. To Ch President Patchett, today, what are the capital needs for the Queensbridge houses, the Ravenswood houses, the Woodside houses, and the Astoria houses? They're, <laughs> built, no, well, the aggregate requirement for NYCHA across all of the city is over $30 billion. That's right. And those four uh, locations alone, I think, are close to a billion dollars. That's right. A billion dollar capital need for the four public housing developments in Western Queens right. today. So I ask you, President Patchett, yeah. on behalf of Mayor de Blasio, do you support taking the $500 million capital grant cash in the hand to Jeff Bezos and Amazon and pulling that out of the deal and redirecting all $500 million to the four public housing developments in Western Queens today? What we certainly support is the state take, setting aside a portion of its funding that they're receiving for uh, residents, because it's so, $14 so why didn't dollars. the mayor, why didn't the mayor, in agreeing to this deal, say, we want Amazon, we want the jobs, uh, you have the as of right, but you cannot, and we will not, as a city of New York, agree to give you $500 million to build your buildings. We're gonna take that money. Why don't you all do that right here, right now? We're gonna take the $500 million, $500 million, and we're gonna redirect it to those four public housing developments in Western Queens. So I just wanna step back for one second. We're, we are getting, $30 billion in tax revenue statewide as a result of this effort. As a part of that, we are going to discount that by about $3 billion. That's correct, that's the way it works. In any other context, when you get, someone gives you $30 billion and 25,000 jobs, and you say, you can have three billion of that rebated back to you. Most people call that a pretty good deal. Well, I would just say Amazon's not giving us anything. They're giving us right? $30 billion. They're, Amazon is coming to New York, which is the greatest city in the world. Uh, and I just want to redirect to uh, Mr. Hoosman. Would Amazon, as a trillion dollar corporation, doing very well, yeah. and, and again, um, that's your right as a for-profit corporation, would Amazon agree today to say, you know what, we don't need the $500 million. Jeff Bezos and Amazon can afford to build its headquarters on its own and still make lots of money. So would Amazon today agree to take that $500 million state capital grant and redirect that money right to the four public housing developments in Western Queens? So we're gonna create jobs here in the city. We're gonna have a positive economic impact. We're gonna create $27 billion of additional tax revenue for this project. And we also look forward to working with our new neighbors, with the workforce um, um, units. But uh, Council Member, I also want to uh, kind of talk about the $5 million workforce development grant that you mentioned uh, in the opening. I just wanna emphasize that is an initial amount. There will be more uh, for right. workforce I, I would funds. put it more succinctly and say that crumbs off the end of the table, right? Crumbs off the end of the table. And, and the mayor and the governor, again, because now there is this process, right? And, and we will try and come to a number, right, of, of what's appropriate for workforce development. But I heard an estimate uh, from someone in the know that it's more like 150 to 180 million just for workforce development alone. But by agreeing to this deal, the mayor and the governor have set the bar so low and expecting so little, and that's a bad way to negotiate. I just wanna say this to President Patchett once again. Um, you always talk about the return on investment of this deal uh, and why it's so good, but you never talk about how much it's gonna cost the city of New York to actually uh, account for all of what's happening increases in fire and police and all sorts of costs. So let me ask you today, what is your estimate for how much the city will need to invest in tran transportation infrastructure in Queens and New York City as a result of this deal? So, council member, you have emphasized that there are infrastructure needs in the community today. Um, and we're committed to working with you to try to invest in those. Those are needs of the community today. 
The advantage, as I know you've long believed, and others in the community have, is have the advantage of having commercial is that they, and people who are working there during the day, is that they don't use infrastructure in the same way. So they'll be taking the seven train to Long Island City, not from Long Island City. I understand. They'll be using, they won't be using this. The, one of the biggest issues in the community, as I know you've emphasized importantly, is the schools. So there was a plan for putting residential units here. I realize it was still subject to public approval, but there was a plan to put over 5,000 units of residential housing here. That would have had a significantly greater impact on schools and infrastructure in the community than doing Sure, uh, but I asked space. the question I asked is is do you have an estimate of how much increased funding will need to be invested for transportation infrastructure today? Do you have that number? So what we'll do is an environmental impact statement to identify the necessary mitigations as we would in a ULERP. All right, so we don't know the number for that. Do we know how much money exactly you're going to invest in schools as a result of this deal? There, there, there will be no new residents moving to Long Island City as a result. So we don't need new schools. I'm saying, so just to be clear, your question is, what is the impact of them coming? You're trying to, you're trying to try to come up with a number associated with infrastructure that's necessary as a result of this. Right, and I seem to, you seem to say, just as Deputy Mayor Glenn said, we don't need affordable housing anymore no. because all these jobs are so well paying, no. right? No. That you just said that because of the changes in the deal, that the need for schools has somehow been mitigated. No, I'm saying that l relative to housing, which was the plan here, there's gonna clearly be a lower impact on schools to the community. So relative to that, the need for investment in schools is lower than it otherwise would, but it's, but it's absolutely our commitment to work with you to identify the necessary investments. That's in fundamentally wrong because we have a shortage of seats today in Western oh. Queens. We have the two most overcrowded school districts today in Western Queens. Yeah. And how could you believe that there isn't a greater need projected with 25, 40,000 employees plus the way it's going to change housing patterns? I want to move on because it's clear that though you have an estimate of how much money you think this deal is going to bring in, you have no numbers in terms of what it's going to cost us, that's going to change your calculation. I want to talk about non-disclosure agreements. Council member, so, if I may, the MOU, we will provide space for a 600-seat school. With all due respect, Mr. Hoosman, we had two new schools coming as a result of the, the two ULURPs that were planned. And because the administration cut a deal with you to, to merge those two into one, we actually lost a school. And the fact that you're making space, a trillion dollar uh, company, for a school that was already in the works, we're getting nothing new out of that. Nothing. Not one thing for the community. Right, Once again, let's turn to non-disclosure agreements. But you can't, you can't have it both ways, though, Council Member. You can't say that the residential units then wouldn't. You can't assume you get the schools without the residential input units, which would have had a significantly greater impact on infrastructure. We have the need already. I agree, and, and I said, but, that, but you're trying to characterize it as a need as a result of this project. There Truth, will be, honestly. Th I absolutely fundamentally there'll be increased need for school seats as a result okay. of the, this okay, project. Well, I, and you know, where I, I hear you. Some of those Amazon employees are going to live in Western Queens. So they'll live and in. they're going to have children, and their children are going to need to go to schools. Yeah. And where are they going to go to school? Yeah. And we're, in the school you didn't build. And we're, That's wrong. We're, we're, so let me just say, let me just say, once again, let's get to non-disclosure agreements. Do you, President Padgett, believe that the practice of government officials signing non-disclosure agreements about economic development deals where public taxpayer dollars are being given away is good government? I believe that non-disclosure agreements are necessary from time to time when you're dealing with companies who have proprietary business information. For example, we deal with life sciences companies all the time who are developing new drugs and they are interested in accessing our incubators or other resources to improve uh, access to uh, talent in New York City. So they bring share that information with us. It's proprietary. They don't want it shared with everyone. So maybe we'll agree to a non-disclosure agreement with them. So you we would not support a ban on government officials signing non-disclosure agreements about economic de development deals where public tax dollars are being given away. Um, I, Council Member Lander, I know, has discussed this. I'm happy to look at a draft of legislation. Did you, the Deputy Mayor or Mayor de Blasio, ever express reservations about signing the non-disclosure agreements? You know, I, I'm not sure that it, the only, we talked about the non-disclosure agreement. Uh, it was part of Amazon's public RFP. We reviewed it with uh, elected officials who were part of the geographies um, that were part of the bid in our proposal in October, of t in our presentation in October of 2017. It then came up in our two public hearings uh, at the, before the City Council that I had earlier this year. 
The only person who raised any questions about it was Councilmember Lander. I frankly heard no concerns about the non-disclosure agreement from anyone until the last four weeks, even though it was very much public knowledge that it was a part of this. So the question was, did Mayor de Blasio have any reservations about that? I never heard any from you. Okay, great. Uh, Mayor de Blasio often fails to meet face to face with his commissioners and other high ranking members of this administration. Did you ever meet with the mayor personally on the Amazon deal? Yes. How often did you meet with Mayor de Blasio on the Amazon deal? Uh, frequently. How frequently? I don't have a specific number, but uh, over. I certainly spoke to him or met with him in person over 10 times. Just on Amazon? Yes. So the mayor cannot meet with many of his own commissioners about everyday city business and how this city functions, but he can meet with you 10 times at least in the last year just on this Amazon deal. The, the, the mayor speaks frequently with people on the phone and over conference calls. As, he, as we did frequently about the Amazon deal. James, honestly, I've yeah. been res more respectful in this questioning I of agree. you than you have been with me. That's a disgraceful answer. Um, the NDA, the NDA that was signed by members of this administration says in section eight that the agency will return or destroy all tangible materials embodying confidential information promptly following Amazon's request. Have you or anyone in this administration destroyed or returned materials to Amazon at this point? No. Okay. Uh, I have here the 29-page request for information questionnaire that Amazon asked each city to answer. Uh, some cities have released uh, that document. Uh, has the city of New York released the answers uh, to this RFI questionnaire? Uh, we put a, many documents on our website yesterday. With like, Including was, this one and then took it down, no? Uh, I'm, I'm not certain. I'm happy to share it with you, though. So you will make the answers to this document public uh, and put it on the website just as you have all the other documents? Happy to provide it to you, yeah. And we can put it on the website, sure. Okay, but uh, it did appear and then it, it disappeared. Uh, so with respect to that uh, uh, document, uh, in real estate section uh, RE4, the planning zoning question 4B asks, will the government commit to rezoning prior to site selection? Do you recall how you answered this question? I, <laughs> I don't, but certainly we didn't. But you offered to bypass ULERP throughout the process? It really never came up in specifics until the very end of the process. But it was in the documents. The speaker raised it earlier. Uh, it was uh, very clearly uh, there. There are at least six pages in this document, six pages of questions where Amazon asked specifically about taxes and incentives. Uh, the three billion dollar package that came out of that um, to Amazon, did you need the three billion dollars in order to come to New York? We, we, we negotiated with 20 different locations during the finalists during the spring. We made uh, 20 different site visits. Um, as we've said previously, talent was the primary driver for our location decision to come to New York, and we're super excited to be here and hire New Yorkers. Incentives were certainly a, a part of that process, and they were a priority for us. So uh, it was indeed why you came to New York, or a big part of why you came to New York? The primary reason was talent. Incentives were, were a part of that decision-making process. So. Uh, the Plaxall property that um, uh, the speaker mentioned earlier, so a privately owned uh, piece of land included in the general project plan um, uh, that is not related to the Amazon project. Well, it's so certainly related in the sense that it's immediately next door, was part of the initial public approval process, and we made it possible for them to build commercial space, which we very much hope will be related to the project in the sense that we hope that other companies will locate near them. 
So, uh, James, you've disrespected okay, sorry. this body uh, with how you've handled uh, this process. Uh, you uh, bypassed ULERP, uh, and then you also bypassed ULERP uh, for this piece of Plaxol property. I believe it is fundamentally unethical what you have done with the piece of Plaxol property, taking a private property where a private owner of land is going to benefit immeasurably because you and the mayor decided to take that piece of property, fold it in here, bypass ULERP, and allow that private for-profit entity to gain a public benefit and make serious money. You should be ashamed of yourself for that particular piece alone, and you should agree, and you should agree uh, to put that back into ULERP at a minimum. I just want to say, uh, those who agree to this deal, though, who signed to this deal, I have more questions, but I'm going to go now, um, uh, should absolutely be ashamed of agreeing to this deal on behalf of the people of the city of New York. Thank well, you. Thank you, yeah, so I was, we're, we're, let's, we're, let's not ashamed. We're, we're not ashamed of this. We're proud to be here, and we're proud to be delivering these jobs to New York City. So our next round of questions will start with Councilmember Lander, Ku, and Powers. We are going to have a four-minute clock with each council member within those time limits. But we are getting some questions in on the board behind us. One of the ones that just popped up was of the jobs based in New York, and this comes from um, uh, Mr. Michael Stone, I believe. May you expect to be unionized? How do you plan on reassuring New Yorkers that you won't engage in the kind of any abusive labor practice or any anti-union campaigns that may have you engaged elsewhere? That's a, one of our tweets. I would respectfully disagree with the premise of the question that we have engaged in anti-union practices uh, elsewhere. We absolutely respect an employee's right to choose whether to join or to not join a union. And I would say the mayor from the outset um, we said that this is the announcement. Bringing Amazon to New York City is an opportunity for us to engage with them about the beliefs and values of New York City, which are that unionization is important. And we're thrilled as a result of that that they're going to be working with SEIU for their building workers, their first agreement with them ever, a result of coming to New York City. They're going to be working with the building trades, which is a significant step for us. And so we're excited to continue these conversations and also the opportunity to have these discussions before this body. Um, we think we'll further the opportunities to encourage the company to work more with union labor. James, did you ask, did, did, did the city ask them to sign a neutrality deal? So that their card check so that their workers who work could get unionized? Did the city ask that to happen? We asked them to work with unions, yes. And we what are that, Hold on, what does that mean, work with unions? Besides 32BJ and um, building the building trades, trades what, what do you mean work, by, work with you unions? You mean besides the, those two unions? We asked them at their corporate headquarters to work with the relevant unions, yeah. What, but what does that mean, work with unions? To commit to working with them. What do you mean, to, hire, to have their workers be unionized? Do you know about their anti-union practices around the world? Uh, I'm, shh. I've, I've certainly read the media coverage that you have. And what do you think we're about very, that? We're, we're certainly concerned about some of the reports that we've seen. But that being said, this is a focus on the jobs at the headquarters. We're thrilled to have them here. And we are excited that they're going to be working with union labor, as the mayor has emphasized from the beginning, beginning is an important value for this city and for this council, I know, as well. And we, we do already have a relationship with 32BJ in our um, New York City offices. We look forward to continuing that relationship in our Long Island City headquarters. And we're, we don't have development plans yet. Um, as soon as we get those, we look forward to sitting down with the trade unions also, developing that relationship and finding out how we can best partner moving forward. And we fully expect to use union labor during the construction of our project. We love 32BJ and we love the building trades, but this is not about two unions. This is about all unions and all working people to make sure they're protected. That's what this is about. Councilmember Orlando. Councilmember Orlando. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this hearing. Uh, Mr. Huseman, earlier in this hearing, uh, in response to the speaker's questions, you affirmed that Amazon provides facial recognition technology to ICE, saying we think the federal government should have access to the best technology. Um, as I understand it, the ACLU showed that this best technology falsely matched 28 members of Congress to mugshots in a database, disproportionately people of color. 
Do you understand that what we hear in this room when you say that is that in, in pursuit of profit, <laughs> Amazon is a willing partner in Trump's deportation machine, which will very likely lead to the deportation of immigrants in Queens, exactly the people that you claim to want as your neighbors? So as to that... As to that ACLU study, we have not been able to replicate the findings of that. Um, as to the overall uh, question about our record on immigration, we have a very strong and public stance on immigration issues, and we've lobbied, we've advocated on behalf of DACA, on behalf of DREAMers, and on behalf of green card reform. I think that'll come as cold comfort to people who are picked up as a result of your facial recognition technology and that they won't be that happy with you as, as your neighbors. So what I want to go to, though, is we've obviously got so many questions about the tax breaks and the clawbacks, about job quality and job access and workers' rights and infrastructure and transit. Those are all challenges that we can solve as a city, but only if we have the democratic capacity to address them. So I'd like to use my time to talk about the relationship between Amazon's growing monopoly power and our local democracy. It's my understanding that when the city council in Seattle sought to impose a tax on several hundred large businesses to try to address affordable housing and homelessness, that Amazon threatened to halt construction on a new tower and to sublease the property and also contributed to the Chamber of Commerce's effort to overturn that effort. Is that correct? So uh, a couple of points. I want to respectfully disagree with the premise that Amazon is a gr growing monopoly. Amazon uh, competes in many different... Can you answer the question that I asked? I, I, well, we'll answer the head text I only question. have the four Absolutely. minutes, so okay. I really I'm, would I'm appreciate so sorry. it. I'm uh, sorry. Amazon competes in uh, uh, the global retail market, and uh, we're all about uh, prices, less selection, uh, more selection, and more uh, convenience. As to the uh, issue of the head tax uh, in Seattle, we've been a leader in the fight against homelessness in Seattle. Did you threaten to cease construction, sublease your property, and contribute to the Chamber of Commerce's effort to overturn the tax. So we have partnered with organizations like Mary's Place in Seattle. You, you know you did, because Amazon spokesman Drew Herdner said, I can confirm that pending the outcome of the head tax vote by city council, Amazon has paused all construction planning on our Block 18 project. Um, it's also come to my understanding that Amazon led the lobbying last year uh, in an attempt to amend the Washington State Equal Pay Act to preempt local governments like Seattle from adopting stronger pay equity laws that would help close the gender and race pay gap. Is that correct? So as to the issue of the head tax, we did not support the head tax. We believe that that was a tax uh, on job growth and well, on investment. Your spokesman already answered that you did the things I asked about. Is it also true that you contributed to the lobbying effort to preempt local efforts by Washington municipalities from passing stronger pay equity laws? No. The question is, did Amazon lead that? We did not. We're members of several different business associations. The lead sponsor of the issues. bill, Represent Tana Sen, said in negotiations over the bill, Amazon fought hard to bar cities like Seattle from going farther than state law in efforts to close the gender and race pay gap. Microsoft didn't care about preemption. The mainstream didn't care about preemption. It has been led by Amazon. I'm happy to so, follow up with you on that. Uh, I look forward to it. So this really gets to the, to the crux of my questions. Um, I think we have the capacity to manage the growth that 25,000 jobs would represent and to do what's necessary to share them fairly. But we can only do that if we've got a strong local democracy. And given that Amazon threatened a capital strike when the city council in Seattle tried to address the housing and homelessness crisis, something that would have amounted in its first year to $12 million of your $178 billion annual revenues, supported a Chamber of Commerce effort to undermine not just that law, but honestly confidence of the people of Seattle in their government government, led the effort to preempt cities in Washington from adopting stronger pay equity laws, conducted a bidding process that was a hunger right, games race question. to the bottom of 238 cities, giving you all this data you could use in future deciding decisions, required the 20 finalists to sign a non-disclosure agreement, hiding the information about our bids from members of the public and their elected officials, and are choosing to go along with avoiding New York City's democratic land use review process, how can we possibly believe that Amazon will not continue to abuse its monopoly power to erode our democratic capacity to govern our city? So, so. There were a lot of questions, a lot of issues there. I look forward to uh, kind of talking with you about those more.
Council Member Peter Ku. I don't see how we could believe it. Thank you. I think it's probably time to rethink the prime account. After Ku, we're going to have Council Member Inez Barron. Peter, Mr. Council Member Ku. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representatives from Amazon and Mr. Patrick from GDC. Uh, I speak here today uh, not only as a elected official, but also as a representative of small business owners. Uh, Amazon, no, I think you know, it's the greatest thing invented since like, the slice back, you know. You are the company people love to hate, you know. Because we hate you, but we also love you, right? Every one of you, every one of us here, when they go home, they will order stuff from Amazon. You know? mm. Why? I don't. Amazon, as a, its name implies, is the biggest jungle on earth. But it sucks up all the oxygen the small business beef, uh, owners breathe. I'm a small business owner. I know many small business, business owners, their business suffer because the creation, since the creation of Amazon. So this is only the beginning of the, a long dialogue. I hope companies like you, because of your size, because of your wealth, will do more things for the community when you come in. Because uh, even in my neighborhood, <coughs> we have a small development, and the, the developer agreed to give us like two, two uh, million dollars for uh, community uh, uh, development. A uh, big size company like you, uh, you can only give $5 million for workforce development. It's not enough. When you open a company in China, you are required to open schools, dormitories, and everything in the community. So I hope you will do the same thing for us. Otherwise, you know, there's no fair competition because we love you, but we also hate you. <laughs> no. Because I mean, I mean, people like you, like people don't shop in retail anymore. They will go home and order online because your stuff is a couple of dollars cheaper and you deliver, right? So your business model is good, but sooner or later, you become the monopoly of America. You know, you, super, uh, you uh, overtake the supermarkets, the pharmacy, uh, uh, all the retail, you know? You, so I hope, like, I want to hear from you what kind of things uh, you will do for Long Island City the, in terms of infrastructure improvement, in terms of uh, like schools, in terms of housing. Because the, the minute your announcement to come to Long Island City, condominium prices in the area increase 15%. The minute you are, no, they know. So this is not good for the community, but the houses will be very expensive. So I want you to address to those problems, housing, school, infrastructure improvement, et cetera. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and I appreciate the invitation to have an ongoing dialogue. As to your small business um, uh, comment, uh, more than half of what you buy on Amazon is not sold by us, but it's sold by third parties, including small businesses. And we have tens of thousands of small businesses in New York that are able to reach customers around the world uh, from selling uh, on Amazon. In addition, um, in our headquarters, we want to invite small businesses in for uh, cafes and food services. And as I mentioned, we also encourage our employees to go out uh, in the neighborhood. So we want to have a very uh, connected uh, relationship with the community. As to your questions about housing and infrastructure and, and transportation, um, our success uh, in Long Island City uh, also depends upon making sure that we as, uh, as a company and that we as a community uh, address those challenges. And so we look forward to working with all of you on those. Thank you. And, and we're just going to, add to, to that based on the Holly, just sorry, I'm just on, based on the fact that we have the time limits to one o'clock, I want to make sure that the council members are heard. Right. So we're not going to entertain questions. Thank you like very much. I, I strongly believe job creation you, is the biggest Kuhl. important thing the government should do for the people. Now we're going to people. have council member Inez Barrett, and followed by uh, Keith Bowers, then Carlina Adams, and uh, let's see, uh, Rivera, Carlina Rivera, sorry. So Inez, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. And 
thanks to all of my colleagues who see this as a very critical issue. And we're going to hear, we've heard already about the extent of the giveaway that the city and the state has given to the richest corporation that we have, richest man that's here. And what we're concerned about also is the provision of jobs is great. About five or six years ago, your predecessor, you, you were preceded at this in trying to get this land grab and bringing this great offer of jobs when Walmart tried to get its toe in New York City. People said, oh, it's a done deal. Walmart's the biggest. You can't fight Walmart. We're fighting you. And we're fighting you. We're fighting you because we don't accept the process that got us to this point. You've taken the L in Europe and replaced it with an S, and you're trying to usurp the power of the people to be able to say what is fair and what is good in the totality of what we want to see in New York City. So I see this as Walmart 2.0, and we're going to continue to fight because we object to the process that has brought us to the point. There were council members who at the outset said, well, let's examine what Amazon can bring to New York City. In spite of your poor labor record, in spite of the atrocities which I read about last week, I think, uh, in the New York Times of workers who were immigrants who've come to this country and were forced to stand and <coughs> Product and, and push the, their assembly line process. Many of them were women who were pregnant, who got no accommodations. So in spite of that, we were willing to listen to what you were going to offer to bring to New York City. But for the governor and the mayor to have extended this great financial benefit and given land that was already being considered for housing, which we know is a critical issue, giving that up, not having that continue to go through the EULA process is unacceptable. We know that for years the city and the state have disinvested in CUNY. CUNY is a great important topic to me and I am the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. So now we want to give away $500 million when we could have taken that $500 million, added another $300 million to that, and provided CUNY as a true tuition-free institution, not one that gives on one hand and takes on the other. So we're very disappointed that we're at this point, and to hear you say, no, we're not going to consider some of the issues that council members have put on, and the speaker as well, has put on the table to ask you, will you consider withdrawing that? And we say you're in for a battle, you're in for a fight, and the end is not yet what will become at the end of this deal. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Keith Powers. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for having this hearing. Thank you for being here. I just wanted to correct the record for a second. Uh, I think the comment earlier was that Councilmember Lander is the only one who's inquired about Amazon. February 6, 2018, it was the first Economic Development Committee hearing, the first one I ever sat in. I actually asked about the economic incentives being offered to Amazon. Do you want to respond? It was about the non disclosure agreement. Nine day, okay. And I, but I want to do note that the response there was that the city was not offering them anything in terms of Correct. In discretionary. I, I don't know if the word discretionary is used. Yes. Definitely. But incentives, but, um, but certainly I think a complete answer to that would have been there are as of right benefits available and we are willing to offer them land. And I mean, they're, the, the benefits they get, are, I think, are beyond what they're offered just by as of right, just to be clear here. Um, but I just wanted to correct the record because we did ask about it in that yeah, transcript. Of, that video is live on, on the website. Um, I'm just going to hit with a couple of questions quick. I, I will say you've heard a lot of frustration here and everybody, I think, is right to, to voice frustration about the community and the council being left out of the process because every other project in New York City has to go through this. Not only does it offer them a competitive advantage, in my belief, to, do, to skip that process, but also um, it takes away all the other review process that folks have to go. There's a cost associated with that, and there is a competitive advantage uh, associated with that when you let one employer skip it. Whether we think the benefit is right or not, I think it's, I think it's uh, an unfair advantage offered to one company. So just a few questions here, though. The $500 million from the state 
state. I know they're not here, but I hope you can answer. Mm -hmm. Is that contingent on job creation or is that discretionary no matter what? And, and if so, I'm just gonna ask them all again. Right. If so, how many jobs? Second is, can you tell us any instances where GPP has used, there's a number of examples that have been offered where there's been no state land included and how many? Has any done, been done for a single employment, a single project versus a, a, a Atlantic Yards, Times Square type of project? Um, and uh, that's it. And then the, set, the, um, the third question is, the also on the state side, there is a discretionary part of this in the Excelsior Jobs Program. They choose how much they put into that in terms of this job subsidies. Can you tell us why 6% was decided as the, uh, as, the, as the number? And also, is that going to be 6% for wages that go up to any amount, meaning to somebody who makes a million dollars a year is the state subsidizing that job? And I'll ask one more, I hope I get good track, is you have talked a lot about LIC as a commercial hub, and, and it turned to, it's, instead it really has turned into a residential community, proximity to Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, where lots of jobs are. Um, and it has not turned into the commercial hub, as you have noted, and this is meant to kickstart that, and Amazon is meant to be the kickstart to that. But perhaps that means something there, maybe, you know, I would love just to hear an exp explanation why it has not turned into a commercial hub, despite efforts to make it so, and whether this is potentially fitting a square into a circle mm -hmm. uh, in terms of something that people really desire to be a residential community within proximity mm -hmm. to the residential uh, neighborhood versus being the commercial hub. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank sure. you. Sure. I have a list of 12. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Absolutely. There was a robust conversation at the um, at our economic development oversight hearings. I didn't want to suggest there wasn't. Just specifically about the NDA was a limited discussion. But um, so let me make sure to cover your questions. I want to start by saying, re-emphasizing, what we sought to do here was to represent the interests of the city. The mayor from the beginning said we weren't going to offer any discretionary incentives. We didn't. And there, there's public land as a part of this. Yes, it's a lease, and it is subject to a fair market value terms. We're not giving it to them. It's subject to fair market value terms. So they're paying what we would have otherwise received for it. Um, on the question of specifically a general project plan, so you know, we really do believe that GDP is the required component to make this project happen uh, because we believe it's appropriate when it's necessary to achieve the desired policy outcome, uh, either because the actions are not possible through ULERP, like the pilot fund here, or when the land use actions are so complicated, the GPP is just the practical mechanism to move it more quickly. You know, we believe the ULERP would have taken significantly longer and not meant the company's hiring timelines. They said just before they needed it quickly, um, and we believe we're able to provide it that way through this mechanism. There's, we're enabling the pilot funds for the GPP. We're doing agency relocation as a part of this. We're potentially doing street demappings. Uh, we're, we're also critically allowing the public to hold title during the project so we can hold the company even more accountable, which is definitely not possible through ULERP. Um, as to your question about the la absence of state land, there was no state land on 42nd Street. There was certainly no state land uh, in the Columbia GPP. I'm sure there are other examples. Uh, just a couple for you. Um, uh, and then I think the last question is why did not Lyon City not uh, become a commercial community on its own? Just, yet? just, just. There's two questions you didn't answer oh, for it, sure. Right. One is the 500 million dollars being contingent oh. on job oh, yes, creation, sorry. and um, the tax breaks at the state program. Obviously, you were you signed an NDA yeah. to be part of this conversation, so you certainly were part of the table yeah. with okay, the sure. ESD. What, how was six percent decided, and are we subsidizing jobs beyond other state programs like uh, I think the Jobs First program, other programs where it's, it ends at 200k a year uh, mm -hmm. per job? Are we subsidizing jobs up? to a million, two million, three million, whatever the highest paid job would be at this site. Could you get the jobs? Sure. Please. Um, yeah. Okay, so just to start, yes, the $500 million is performance-based. The company hasn't received a dime yet. It's contingent on them building the commercial buildings that they are required to. They will be, it'll be reimbursement only based. Um, and those, the, where they will be constructing them, the leases that we have with the company will also require them to fill the company with Amazon employees or they'll have the potential of not just not, never receiving the incentive but actually losing the properties in the first instance. So it is actually performance-based incentive. Um, and then uh, I, I, I can't go into tremendous detail about the particulars of the state program, but I will assure you that I will have someone from the state directly reach out to you uh, to talk about those. Thank you, Councilman uh, Powers. We're oh, going to move on okay. to Councilmember Carlina Rivera. I'm, okay. Followed Hi. by Councilmember Levine. Good morning. And then 
Councilman Richards. Yep. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you've mentioned a lot, uh, you've mentioned today multiple times about the talent, and it's the talent that, that brought you here. And I think that a lot of us feel that this, that states and cities and municipalities, we should be competing on the underlying strength of our communities and not necessarily public handouts to private businesses. So I realized during the competition that multiple cities have proposed multi-billion dollar incentive packages, but a lot of us want to make sure that this deal does not prove wasteful and counterproductive. So you have expressed a lot of confidence in this package, EDC, I can barely see you, but that's okay. Uh, James, I know you're there. Yeah, I'm here. How does this deal not set up a precedent, a precedent that every major corporation is gonna start asking for from the city in order to stay and grow here? Are we setting ourselves up to be extorted by large corporations? Okay, it's, a, it's a great question, council member. I think to your underlying point, well, we'll um, yeah. you know, I do think that uh, federal policy that allows these competitions across cities is a mistake and that we should consider whether there should be a federal policy that precludes it to, so that cities are not competing against each other. I think from the beginning in this administration what we've done is said we're not offering any discretionary incentives. Certainly the state does it. It's part of their prerogative under their budget. Um, I think the reason that we think it's important as a city not to participate in that is because you know, we fundamentally believe that New York City should be able to compete on its own merits. Um, you know, the, the, there, are, there are two components of this the, that are discretion, that are, that are as of right uh, programs that the company is eligible for today. Those programs are intended to create jobs in the outer boroughs. I think they've been, had a significant amount of bipartisan support for a reason because, you know, it's important to have jobs in your district in, you know, on the Lower East Side and the East Side of Manhattan, but it's also important to have jobs in Queens and downtown Brooklyn, and we've never seen them happen on their own in significant number in the way that those programs were intended. And, to. I, and I realize that you're confident, and I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. That's not my intention, but I don't have a lot of time. Yeah, sure. So to, to go back to the speaker's met mention of the metric of success, I want to talk a little bit more about local hiring and, the, and your partners. Do you, has EDC or Amazon done any sort of analysis to determine where the workers are gonna come from, how many are gonna be from the city, outside of the city, who are you working with in terms of local partnerships and tech organizations, whether it's per scholar, so Civic Hall, or the Flatiron School, how are you creating a real robust program for workforce mm -hmm. development? Because, and I just wanna mention, because I'm gonna ask about the demographics of Amazon, specifically in Seattle, to see how many people of color and women work there. We are not confident that the people that really resemble like this body are gonna be inside of those uh, headquarters. So if you could talk a little bit about your plan to actually make sure that people of Queensbridge and the surrounding communities are going to get those jobs, and then a little bit of how you have a track record of actually hiring the people that I'm mentioning. Okay. Well, I can start, and then I'll turn over. So, the thank you, Council Member. Uh, so, to start, you know, we set up this Workforce Advisory Committee with that exact intention. You highlighted it, and it's important to emphasize. I can't see you. The, okay. um, the, the you know, the, the Rob's the, tall. The, the, yes, the, you know, the committee is going to be co-chaired by uh, Bishop Taylor of Urban Upbound and uh, Gail Brewer, or sorry, Gail Brewer, Gail Mello um, from the uh, from LaGuardia Community College because we think LaGuardia Community College is one of our best institutions in the city, and the fact that they're locally based, have a very diverse student body, um, is an incredible opportunity for Amazon to access that talent. Um, there's also a number of other workforce development providers, as well as the TA presidents of the four local developments. Perscolis is represented on there. We have to work together. But I want to stop, because you're almost out of time, and I want to make sure you get your other question in. Yeah, and Council Member, just kind of briefly, diversity and inclusion are very important to Amazon. From the very beginning of this process, we made that an issue that we were seeking uh, from cities and locations, and we're very excited by the diversity of uh, Queens, of New York City, of Long Island City. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to come here, and we look forward to increasing the diversity of our workforce by hiring New Yorkers. But what does your workforce look like right now in terms sure. of we make, our, uh, we make our demographics uh, available on, uh, publicly on our website, and I will share those with you. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move to Council Members Levine, Williams, and Menchaca, but the next tweet has come in following on the speaker's line of questionings. comes from the thinker. <laughs> it's always good to know as a thinker. Either. What will you do to prevent overcrowding on the subway lines that run through the Long Island City neighborhood? They are already beyond capacity, and 25,000 new riders will break the system. I think that I completely understand the question. I recognize the concerns 
It's already, seven train is also inc already incredibly crowded. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and people who ride it every day, mm -hmm. I know, are struggling with that. I think the, the, the opportunity here is to realize this vision of Lyon City as a mixed-use community, have yeah, people walking to work from Lyon City who never have to get on the train. So those are fewer potential riders, the people who would otherwise be getting on the train to, to go into Manhattan walking to work. It also means people from Eastern Queens get, getting off the train in Lyon City, and it means people from Manhattan commuting into Lyon City where there is extra capacity. But we all have to look at all of this as a part of our environmental impact statement, and if there are impacts, it's our responsibility to mitigate them. Okay, Council Member Levine. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson. And I wanna follow up on the excellent line of questioning from my colleague, Council Member Rivera. Um, uh, Mr. Huseman, you have repeatedly touted the 25,000 job number as being the greatest benefit to the city. But the truth is that many of those jobs are going to go to Amazon employees who you relocate from other facilities in other parts of the country. I think you actually were open about that in describing the plan for HQ2 as being partly a consolidation of far-flung facilities. Many of those jobs are going to go to tech workers around the country who are working with your competitors or coming out of universities. Um, and I, I think you and others have said, well, New York's a place they want to come and live. But of course, that means there are people coming from elsewhere. And, and even the jobs that are going to New Yorkers, uh, many of them will go to people who are already working in tech and already are high skills. So that leaves a number much, much less than 25,000 which is going to go to people who are in the city now, who are New Yorkers today, and who aren't otherwise um, well employed in tech and similar industries. So you've, you've, you've agreed to contingent financing, which is really all tied to the, to, to the gross number that doesn't distinguish between any of these important categories of workers. But there are other major development projects in the city where uh, the employer has signed a community benefit agreement which does get much more specific in, in um, detailing who's going to be hired, specific in geography, uh, sometimes even as specific to a zip code, and also specific to who. It could be people who are on public assistance, people who live in public housing. Um, there are various other categories that, that you can specify in a contract like this. And would, so, so my question is first, can you talk about numbers of people in the most needy category that I that I de detailed, and would you be willing to sign something like that, a community benefit agreement that gets very specific on the geographies and who we are targeting for these jobs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, this will. Um, this is not just relocating employees from Seattle. Part of the uh, purpose of HQ2 was to expand uh, the talent base that's uh, that's available to us. So we, so we are looking um, to hire uh, New Yorkers uh, locally. As far as the the breakdown of the jobs, uh, about half are technical jobs and about half are non-technical jobs, and that's based upon the breakdown in our Seattle headquarters. We want to. Uh, we have a, there's a great talent base um, here in New York that we can hire uh, on day one for both categories, but we also want to work uh, with you and community leaders to develop that pipeline uh, of talent for both sets uh, of jobs. As to uh, any agreements or future commitments, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of this and happy to talk with you about uh, what you have in mind and what would be useful. And if I could add also, Council Member, I mean, I, I think there's a, a misconception that these 25,000 jobs are going to plop down on Long Island City in a year. Um, so our, our headcount plans, which are in the MOU, they're, they're publicly available. Um, and of course tied to all the other agreements. Um, so we're looking at hiring between 2,000 and 3,000 on an annual basis within New York. James, do you have the number of figures that you generally jobs created in New York City um, on an annual basis, a, a round number? Sorry to put yeah, you on no, the spot. <laughs> we, yeah, we've created close to 400,000 jobs in New York City over the last five years. But I, I also want to say, I mean, New York City has always been a city of immigrants. You know, I mean, we have to support our existing residents, but we also have always encouraged people to come here. That's what New York City has always been about. Right, but there, my time is almost up. There are okay. people in need in this city. Absolutely. And if they're not the ones we're serving, then we have failed in, in a very fundamental way. And the existing tools that EDC has, uh, NYC Hire, et cetera, don't have the kind of teeth 
that are going to guarantee the jobs go to the people in need. They're really, it's about first look, that's, that's the term. Yeah. And sure, the employer has to look at the resumes, but you don't know who they're going to hire in the end. And there are people in need in Western yeah. Queens and other cities who need the jobs. And we need a mechanism that guarantees the people in need get these jobs. Short of that, we are failing in a fundamental way. Yeah, Councilmember, yeah. if I could also respond to that, I mean, in addition to the 25,000 jobs that we'll create, you know, in, in the headquarters, there's going to be hundreds of construction jobs, other jobs that will be continuing to support our ongoing operations. And we look forward to being a long-term partner with the community. And again, we're here to listen. We're here to learn. It's very early in the process. And, and we, uh, we look forward to these partnerships. We are committed to hiring New Yorkers. Thank you, Councilman Levine. Now, Councilman Monty Williams. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. I had opportunity to read both of the testimonies. I actually found them pretty disingenuous, um, and I didn't really think it was worth the paper it was on. I'd recommend that the panel uh, increase the fiber in your diet uh, to help out with some of the stuff that I've heard here today. Uh, but, uh, and I don't have a lot of time to run through it, but the first thing that frustrated me uh, EDC, and you a few times said at that moment an economic development project like this would have been welcomed with open arms, describing a situation that doesn't exist uh, and saying if it might exist. I'm a hip-hop head, and uh, there's a line that I remembered. It said, if it was a spliff, we'd all be high. So these ifs um, are not something I think we should base uh, these kind of projects on. But council member, Amazon, the point, the point uh, was wasn't finished, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Amazon, I did read your testimony. It was pretty flowery. Um, it doesn't mention anything about the helipad. It doesn't mention much about the land use. It briefly talks about um, the uh, money you're going to be received. But it makes it seem as if that was not the reason you came. Um, so if that was not the reason you came, it seems that we didn't need to offer it to you to begin with. And so all of that is very frustrating to me. I wish I had the time to go deep into all of those questions. I'm going to focus some of my questions on the NDAs. And so I'd like both uh, people to respond. EDC, did you try to negotiate this term? Uh, why did you agree with it? And Amazon, I'd like to know why you require it. Right, so I'd just like to first respond to your point uh, in your opening, council member. The, the point that I was making in my testimony is, yes, it's a great economic moment right now, but we can't pretend like New York City is always going to be in this moment. It's not a hypothetical, it's a when, not an if, when New York City is going to struggle again, and we have to be thinking about that. We can't be naive and assume that New York City will always be in the moment we're in right now. I think that's critically important. I think that's all of our responsibility as city leaders. Uh, I've been a steward of the budget for almost nine years. I'm well aware of the fluctuations of the market. Mm -hmm. We have to make those decisions every single year mm -hmm. uh, what and, and trying to do that to make sure we can survive another downturn this project I do not want to pretend is a response to that okay. well we can agree to disagree about that. we will to to your <laughs> to your <laughs> spliff comment notwithstanding the um, so as to your um, as to your uh, your question uh, we absolutely we did negotiate the non-disclosure agreement we always do Amazon why do you require it yeah, from the beginning of this process, we wanted it to be open. We uh, laid out uh, for locations what our criteria were that we were looking for, and cities responded with. I, I don't have much time. I'm sorry. I just want to know why do you require yeah. it? So non-disclosure agreements are very common in these types of negotiations, so there can be a free flow of information, and so we could exchange confidential information with the city. And since the agreements have been public, as you know, the MOUs uh, are now uh, public, and uh, additional materials are being made available. EDC, so you're saying this is common practice uh, for the mayor and administration to sign these NDAs? So, you know, what I said previously um, was that, it, you know, we, uh, we do occasionally have to sign a general, uh, a, um, an NDA. Uh, that's because we all get proprietary information from companies, like, for instance, a life sciences company is developing a new drug, and they need to be able to share that proprietary information with us so we can give them access to our incubators and other R&D facilities in the city, or a utility that has, infrastructure, that has critical infrastructure that might need to be moved or relocated, and they're sharing the plans for that. All right. They let don't me, want it to be subject to- Let me rephrase you know, it. Is it common practice for, for you to provide early notice of public record disclosures? Is it common practice to do so for the purpose of allowing a company to seek a protective order? So, uh, so is our responsibility to, to 
follow the law, which is FOIL in New York City and New York State. So, that wasn't my question, and I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. Is this common practice? Is, is which common practice? Is it common practice to provide early notice of public records disclosures, and is it common practice to do so with the purpose of allowing a company to seek protective order? Uh, okay. It is common practice for us, as we did in this agreement, to emphasize to everyone that notwithstanding any non-disclosure agreement, we're still obligated to follow the law of New York City and New York State, mm -hmm. which is that we're subject to So it's order. common practice for you to allow companies uh, to seek a protective order. I, I just want to say, you know, I thank you for this hearing. I hope it continues. Uh, I don't know who I'm more angry at, uh, the administration or Amazon. I expect this from the governor, uh, but people don't do to you what you don't allow, and we allow this to happen. I am uh, particularly frustrated uh, with this, giving a helipad when there's no heat, uh, and in many of our NYCHA, uh, I wish these kind of things would happen with the MTA uh, or with NYCHA. It is quite frustrating, and how dare the mayor use my name on a letter, uh, that's the most frustrating part. Uh, I only agreed to engage in a conversation. I would have never agreed to a deal such as this. I hope they never come and ask me for this type of signature again. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. And before we get to Councilmember Menchaca, a few of the questions in the live tweets just came in. Uh, let's also be cognizant of the fact that we have Amazon to one o'clock. So if you have questions for Amazon, to so make sure you get those in quickly. What kind of jobs, this comes from uh, Juan Walker, what kind of jobs will be offered for people with disabilities and with veterans and what, what, what labor pay rate? Amazon has a strong history of uh, uh, employing people with disabilities and veterans. Uh, and we can talk with you about that in more detail, but we're a leader um, in both of those uh, areas. Okay, thank you. Councilman Machuk. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm gonna throw some questions uh, in four minutes and. And if she could start writing them down, that'd be great. Uh, well, one, I just want to say I did not sign that letter in the beginning. I was incredibly suspicious, even when lobbied by many people in government, and with the promise, even with the promise that Industry City was not going to be part of the development plan. It'd be great to confirm that that is not even still part of your expansion in case, in case you might need space. I want, to, I want to hear from you all now that Industry City and other places as you think about more space outside of Long Island City is not on the table. Next, um, kind of curious about the homeless issue. We haven't even spoken to, we heard a little bit about housing, but I'm thinking about the impact to need for housing, not just in Queens, but the ultimate gentrification that's happening around spaces like this that are so massive in need for jobs and housing. The folks that are gonna be getting these jobs are high paid jobs that can pay higher rents and push people out and into our homeless system. This doesn't seem like, like a, like a well job. This is more for EDC. Address what's the impact of homelessness? Are you, are you projecting that? And where are the benefits and, and uh, financial instruments for the homeless issue? The next part is the data collection, and we, we asked some questions about data already. Um, and essentially, it's not just facial recognition for Amazon, this is data in the cloud. You have access to so much information that you sell regularly, both for impact at local economies, local grocery stores, local, et cetera. And so how, how is EDC holding them accountable? How are you holding them accountable to the to the economic impacts, the positive economic impacts, to the to the negative impacts, and I want to see if you've had that analysis yet on on information. Uh, next is the the questions around around the actual subsidy, the nine to one that you keep referring to. Um, we how do we get to zero? I mean, I think that's the ultimate question. How do we how do we get to no no incentives? Even though I know that you're kind of packaged that, but this is the EDC ultimate question. How do we how do we get the most out of a company without having to create incentives, mm -hmm. even if even if they're as of right? Um, and then the last question is the ferry. You are on a waterfront. I represent a waterfront community, and the ferry becomes an opportunity for you that I haven't necessarily heard. I heard about the helicopters. But what is your plan for ferries? And the BQX, uh, the BQX is something that EDC, in a very kind of similar way, is pushing without real kind of public review, and we're gonna be talking about that in the new year. But for Amazon, how, how do you think about the ferries getting to and from the site, uh, and any improvements that you have? And I'll end with, where are we 
where are we thinking in terms of the actual places for negotiation? We've, we've asked you for ULERP, you said no. Uh, you said, we, we're, we're talking about, uh, Van Bramer's talking about schools, you're saying we're giving you one. Then where are we talking about at the end of the day as partners to negotiate? Be clear about where we can actually move the needle on uh, without me having to kind of rip that out of you, where, where are the spaces for negotiation? Okay. You can start at okay. Okay, I'll um, okay. acknowledging okay. that I did not sign that letter and then move on from there. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Councilmember Menchaca. Um, you know, absolutely, I, and then just to be clear, your concerns and others in uh, your neighborhood were one of the reasons that that neighborhood was not included uh, in the proposal to Amazon. Um, so, <clears throat> stepping back um, uh, to try to answer your questions, I am aware of zero plans for the company to go to Industry City. It's certainly not a part of this deal. Um, they can speak for themselves, but there is zero plan for that as far as I am concerned, um, uh, or any other location that I, I'm not aware of any other locations other than the ones that have been publicly documented. Um, the you want us to speak to that now, or do you want me to wait? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> sure, yes. We're going to be very focused on Long Island City and um, creating the, the development plan, going through the proper process, and creating the jobs in Long Island City. Um, you know, as far as uh, homelessness is, is concerned, I think it's an important question. You know, we've obviously, it's a citywide crisis. Uh, you know, fundamentally, the responses to that need to be citywide responses. We need the, it's about the housing plan. It's about, that's why the mayor increased the housing plan by 50%, increased the amount of money going to low-income New Yorkers. We have to double down on those efforts. I mean, it's not about Amazon, but it, it, what Amazon is about is about additional funding so that we can provide for those types of resources. Uh, in terms of accountability, absolutely. Um, you know, the company is going to be extremely accountable through this process, through the leases that we have with them. They're going to hold them to the specific requirements that we... And focus on the data. H how, how is the city keeping them accountable on data, facial rest recognition, we already talked about the ICE contracts. We're trying to make, we're trying to put a ban on revenue contracts for the city, mm -hmm. and yet one of the biggest companies is coming to New York offering all that data, not just for ICE, but for mm -hmm. demolishing our small businesses in our neighborhoods, our immigrant businesses that are the backbone. Not Amazon, our immigrant businesses are the backbone of our communities. Mm -hmm. Well, just when it comes to uh, data, council member, uh, we don't sell data. Uh, we do uh, use data from our customers to improve the customer experience. And I think the best example of that is for the purchase recommendations. So when you buy something, we recommend other things that, uh, that you might uh, like. And we're going to have to move on to council member Richards. Do you have the last questions? So okay. if we can well, answer I've, I've the five. council member's questions. I just have five more left. I'm just five more? That's, okay. No, I mean, okay. So you're happy to... Yeah, so you, a couple more, you, you, you asked about the subsidy, you know, you're right, there's no city subsidy in this other than the discretionary that are available under state law. And the, again, the private property, or the properties that are part of this are subject to fair market value terms. You know, uh, the, uh, the, there was a question about the ferry. I mean, I think there, it's, a, it's great. I think it's a realization of the potential of the ferry. We know it's been good for your community. We hope it'll be uh, good for future communities. You know, we're in the middle of our, uh, of our analysis right now of where we might be able to expand the ferry system uh, is you know, the, there's really no specific uh, agreement. There's nothing about the BQX that's particularly relevant to this deal. It was not discussed in any detail with the company. Um, you know, obviously it's a it's a it certainly could pass nearby the company. We move forward um, and we look you know look forward to talking about the potential impacts on that of this project. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of the go forward process, it's about the community advisory council. It's a mechanism where we have to agree to specific infrastructure commitments as a part of this deal, and the city's committed to doing that. And, and if uh, I'll answer a couple of those too, as far as the ferry and, and transportation. You know, um, as we create these jobs in Long Island City, these are going to be our, our employees and, and the residents of the community also. So we need to work together to make those prudent decisions. Um, the ferry is a great resource. It is run by the city of New York. So we look forward to sharing information <coughs> about ridership so we can make informed decisions together. And when you talk about um, you know moving forward, how we can continue this dialogue and, and actually create those partnerships um, you know, beyond the community advisory committee process, we also want to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, have those conversations, let you ask us the tough questions also. And you're, you know this community, and we're still learning this community. So what ideas you have for us, what direction you have for us, what guidance you have for us, we want to listen to that and make earnest decisions. 
I would just say our guidance is to go through ULERP. Thank you. That's our guidance. So um, I just want to ask the sure, question that came in um, from someone watching. Will Amazon change how it works with the critically important book publishing industry, which makes its primary home in New York City, to be supportive rather than approaching, this is a quote from Jeff Bezos, rather than approaching, quote, small publishers the way a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle. That's what Jeff Bezos said about small book publishers. So I want to understand, since we're the home of book publishing in, uh, in the country, are you going to pursue small publishers the way a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle? I don't know if that quote is, is accurate It's or an accurate not. quote. So, but I will talk about, um, we, we work uh, with publishers uh, well. We also have a service that uh, called Kindle Direct Publishing that allows uh, authors uh, to have their works of art, have their books uh, f uh, to be seen uh, you know, by the world. And we have some great examples of authors whose books weren't published uh, already who have that avenue uh, to reach uh, readers. Uh, Mr. Houseman, I'm, I'm glad you're here, but I feel like most of the questions today you don't directly answer, which is frustrating. I feel like there's a similar refrain, and it's, it's hard when we're trying to ask real questions about Amazon's past practices and how they're going to be good neighbors here in New York City when we get pretty general answers that aren't specific. Who's well, next? I'm sorry, Speaker, you feel that way. We're at the very beginning of this process. We want this to be a dialogue with you, and we're happy to follow up with any other uh, questions that you have now and in the future. Well, I feel like we were brought in towards the end of a process. The beginning of the process started when you started negotiating in private, requiring people to sign non-disclosure agreements, getting $3 billion worth of subsidies, avoiding the land use process. It doesn't feel like the beginning of the process to me. Councilmember Richards. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Speaker, uh, for holding this hearing. Um, so my questions revolve around uh, job creation, and, and certainly I, I'm in support of, of job creation. I think it's important for the economy of our city. Um, but I do have some questions and concerns around who are these jobs specifically for, and I think that's the million-dollar question, jobs for whom. Um, many times when we speak of high-tech jobs, uh, and we hear these, these terminologies, a lot of times our communities are locked out of those conversations largely. So I'm interested in, in knowing is there a specific goal or commitment that EDC, and I guess you can answer this, has tied to job creation for local communities? So is there a specific number, is it 30%? What does MWBE participation look like uh, for this as well? And, and also, are you tying, I know that there are tax incentives attached to this, um, how do we measure success? What are the metrics um, what system is being put in place to track where and who's being hired uh, in the case of, of individuals getting jobs? And, and lastly, just on job standards, because I think that that's important. So we hear about the $150,000 paying jobs, but how many of our public housing residents or residents in that particular community will obviously have access to those jobs? Um, how do you differentiate between those $150,000 jobs, which primarily when we hear high tech, it, it means something else, but when you hear low wage jobs and where they go, it's all, it seems to always be tied to low income communities. So how are we ensuring that residents, what things are being put in place right now, and I think this question should be centered to EDC, I'm not for Amazon. So you got a $5 million deal, what job programming mm -hmm. is being put in place at this moment mm -hmm. to get residents ready for these opportunities. Yeah. And I, I feel like um, if we wait too long, yeah. we're going to be locked out of these job opportunities. So what does the training look like right now? What pre-apprenticeship programs are being thought out right now and being put in place for residents? So when it's time to open those doors, the residents could run in ready. And I'm really concerned that if we stagnate this, that the residents of our communities won't have access uh, to these jobs. 
So I'm happy that Urban Upbound is a part of this, and, and I've worked very closely with Bishop Taylor mm -hmm. on some specific projects in the Rockaways, and we've been able to mandate reporting mechanisms. So uh, I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about that. Right. I think you're right. I think that is the, it's the, it is the most important question. I think it's a, thank you for raising it. Uh, so we fundamentally believe that for this product to be a success, we have to get a wide and diverse range of New Yorkers into these jobs. Fundamentally, if we don't do that, then we're not succeeding on what is possible for this project. Local New Yorkers into these jobs. So, <clears throat> you know, we said- I want to frame it um, okay. because I want, I want it to be politically correct in saying okay. it, but I'm, I want you to speak specifically on how we're going to target black and brown neighborhoods yes. in these communities. I think everybody's beating around that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I really want to specifically, and I, I know that we That's get into it. race and, and all these other things, but I want you to yeah. hone in specifically on how we're going to work with those communities. I, I appreciate that. So, look, it's, it's critically important to us. The first meeting that we took with the company was with the four TA presidents of the local NYCHA developments. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Bishop Taylor is co-chairing our Workforce Development Council in partnership with Gail Mello of uh, LaGuardia Community College. LaGuardia Community College is an incredibly diverse student body that represents you know, many people throughout Queens. Um, I've spoken to her directly a number of times since the announcement, uh, and the, uh, she is confident that we can work together to create some extremely high quality programs to ensure that we get their students into those jobs. And I also had a chance to meet with the CUNY Council of Presidents last week. We're working already today on setting up a centralized process through CUNY through which people can have access to these jobs at many different campuses and also specifically at a few individual campuses including LaGuardia and Queens College where you know they are they have you know specific locations in Queens and there are opportunities through their existing technology programs to you know, directly tie those curricula to what right. Amazon well is doing. thank well thank you for that I have to close out and I look forward to okay. a continued conversation on this and I hear you keep saying LaGuardia Community College and I'm not saying people people in public housing. A lot of times we are locked out of college opportunities as well in our communities. Um, so I, I still didn't really hear the uh, a specific commitment on goals on hiring an MWBE, whether that be 30 or 40 percent. So I'm just hoping that we, as we move forward, that that's okay. a, a big piece of the conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richards. So the good news is on the, on the first round of questions, we're almost through all the council members that are here. So we thank Brian and Holly for staying through it. I know you've mentioned that this is just the first round and you're available for addition comments and questions throughout this, but then we have Council Members Cornegy, Francisco Moyo, Kalos, and Levin uh, to close the first round of questions. So Council Member Cornegy. Uh, thank you, Chair Ballone and the Speaker Johnson. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. I want to drill down on the educational components that will be necessary for viability and sustainability. Right. So I don't want this uh, quick hit or onslaught uh, on uh, integrating communities of color into the jobs, we want sustainability. And I think that that's through a partnership through education, which was mentioned through EDC. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what, uh, what, the long, what, your, what Amazon's long-term commitment to education will be, because quite frankly, um, uh, our students aren't ready mm -hmm. for the jobs that will be ready tomorrow. We're not ready. So I want to know what is the commitment from Amazon to reach back into the local communities through education and not, not just college, we need to start at junior high to prepare. What's the long-term pipeline that uh, Amazon is willing to, and I hope it's in the MOU and that we're not gonna have this conversation here today and it's not a part of the MOU. I haven't had a chance to read the MOU as probably none of my colleagues have, but I'm hoping that included in that is that educational pipeline for viability and sustainability of employment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, we completely agree with you, and we can provide you some additional information about our educational initiatives. One that's in my written testimony that I think is extremely important and gets exactly at the issues that, that you've raised is the <coughs> Amazon Future Engineer Program. So it begins in childhood and goes all the way through college, because you're right, you, can just, you cannot just start uh, the talent pipeline and educational development you know, later on in school years. You have to start at the beginning, inspire students to learn computer science uh, skills, and those are the, that is what we need to make sure that residents can uh, obtain these types of jobs. So I, we would love to be a partner with you in that and can follow up. And, and just as by way of not recreating the wheel, there are orga organizations that are in our schools like the National Society of Black Engineers mm -hmm. uh, who are minority-based 
pipeline programs that would be an easy partnership. So I just want to suggest that to you, and I'd love to talk to you uh, uh, later on about programs that exist in communities of color uh, uh, that want to be a part of a sustainable, viable pipeline. And then that. lastly, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, sponsored a bill, a workforce disclosure bill, that, uh, that um, construction and developers who were getting city subsidies had to disclose their, the makeup of their workforce. Would, you, would Amazon be willing to be a part of a bill that would always keep us abreast of what the makeup is going forward? Yeah, we can certainly talk with you about that. We disclose our uh, nationwide uh, demographics uh, already and are happy to, to talk about what would be useful for the city. Thank you. And, and on your previous question, I'd just like to add to that um, during our site visit in April, um, that, is, that is one of the questions that we really wanted to hone in on is creating those career pathways and that talent pipeline um, really at the beginning. And that's one of the reasons why quite Quite frankly, um, the state and the city team made such a, such a compelling reason for us to locate in New York City. All right. Thank you, Mayor Councilman Cornegy. Now, Councilman Francisco Moya. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Um, as a lifelong resident of Queens, um, someone who proudly didn't sign on to that letter, that makes two M's right here. Um, I think oh, three. Uh, that for me. We have uh, a process here as the chair of um, the subcommittee of zoning and franchising that oversees the Euler process. Uh, this is where I think we're going to run into the biggest problem, and the speaker had mentioned this before, is that there is the clear indication here of bypassing this body. Uh, that would be the body that actually would have the opportunity to review this. Uh, my question is, if you felt that this deal, that the community would support and the council members would support because it benefited the people of New York, why would you choose to engage in a process cloaked in darkness that intentionally avoided, and I would say illegally, the Euler process, which is the mechanism for community boards, uh, activists, and this body to have a voice. And is that because you feared that the council members and the local community would push back on a bad deal? Follow-up question to that, because I know I have a limited amount of time, is since you bypassed the Euler process that requires env environmental impact studies, will you voluntarily here agree to an independent environmental impact study that will report on the economic transit um, study uh, infrastructure and housing impact this will have on our communities along the number seven line as well as the borough and citywide. Okay. Uh, I guess I could take, start this. Thank you, Councilmember Moya. Um, <clears throat> so to start, uh, you know, <clears throat> GPP is a part of state law, it's under the UDC Act, um, and we believe it's, it's, it's an alternative mechanism. I recognize your concerns about it, but you know, we thought it was necessary here to achieve our objectives, and you know, we didn't believe that the, uh, we could achieve this just using a ULERP. You know, we're enabling a pilot fund, which is not possible through ULERP. We're doing agency relocation and site selection. We're five, doing five major, I, I just, I just yeah. want to, sorry, interrupt. But you did five major rezonings here in the city of New York. Yeah. Uh, Inwood, Jerome Avenue, mm -hmm. much bigger areas to cover, and all went through a Euler process. So when you say that this was a project that was of a different magnitude, mm -hmm. I beg to differ. I mean, I've, I've, I've sat here for almost 11 hours listening to testimony from you and from people who come here because of rezonings that have lived in the community for so long, and here they don't have that process that was open to them to voice their concerns. So I disagree with that assessment wholeheartedly. Okay, well, the Europe was, was, was just not possible here to achieve what we were trying to do. We had to enable pilot funds, we had, which is not possible through Europe, period. We're doing agency relocation, the street demapping, and other, another important part is it allows us to hold title of the sites, even the private sites, during the course of construction to hold the company accountable. I think that's really important as a part of this process, also not possible through ULERP. Uh, you know, we, had, we were in a competition. Time was important. They wanted to be able to hire people. Um, 
We felt fundamentally we were focused on getting the 25,000 jobs and delivering for the city of New York. That's what this was about. And you know, stepping to your question about the environmental impact statement, uh, just to the point about it being somehow circumventing the existing process, an environmental impact statement, we're happy to do one because it actually is required under this process. We'll also be going to the community boards, we'll be speaking to the borough president, and we'll be setting up community engagement just like we should. So, yeah. uh, Chair. For another one. Okay. Uh, James, I would just say it, it, it's always a little jarring and alarming to hear we were in a competition. Mm -hmm. We got played. Three billion dollars we're giving away and we're avoiding the public review process and giving away public land. I don't look at it as a competition. I look at it as they were able to pit city after city against each other to see who would give them the best deal in corporate welfare to a trillion dollar company. Yeah. So to, to, to reduce it to we were in the middle of a competition, I think is so reductionist to what actually happened here. And the, the chair of our zoning committee just asked you a question about ULERP. EDC is able to engage and do pilot programs all the time outside of ULERP, right? It's not possible through ULERP to do pilot. You could do ULERP and you could do your pilot agreement separately as you do in other instances. Hudson Yards went through ULERP and there's and, pilots and then, involved there. And then the law changed, yeah. Okay, uh, who's next, Mr. Chair? Uh, Councilmember Kalos and then Levin. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership on this issue and staying throughout this hearing. Thank you to Economic Development Chair Paul Vallone for calling this. I'm gonna try to keep it short. I'm gonna ask that you keep the answer short. Is the private helicopter pad a requirement, as in if there's no helicopter pad, this deal falls through? So it's a part of the agreement, and we think that looking long term, uh, it's an important uh, factor for us. How many of your buildings throughout the world have private helicopter pads exclusively for Amazon's use? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. There is also a helicopter uh, provision in the Northern Virginia MOU. It, and how many employees, which level employees will be receiving? It will be available to the warehouse workers or only for an executive employee or exactly one employee? We have no, uh, no idea about that. You know, we're really um, looking uh, long term at this and we don't have any uh, Do you plans. use helicopters to commute regularly? I do not, personally. Are any other executives that you're aware of use helicopters to commute regularly? Not that I'm aware of. So this would be a new thing? Uh, as far as I'm aware. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, are you familiar with your privacy agreement? Yes, sir. Uh, does your privacy agreement protect customers of Amazon? As you may have read in the New York Post, I am a subscriber to Amazon Prime along with 80 million other Americans. Uh, is there prote privacy protections for customers? Absolutely, customer trust is essential uh, to Amazon. We uh, spell out very uh, specifically and clearly what data we collect, how we use it, how you can access it, and how you can delete it. Did Amazon provide my uh, shopping cart wish list information to members of the media? No, not that I'm aware of. Are you aware of how they happen to come across uh, what types of baby products I wasn't able to obtain in local shops in New York City and uh, write a story about it? I have no idea, sir, but uh, I'm happy to follow up with you about that. Uh, will, you, will, will your privacy team protect people from data breaches and uh, newspapers going after them and what have you? So I'm not aware of any of the specific incidents of, uh, of what you're sure. talking about, but I will uh, look into it. And I will again emphasize that protection of our customers' data is very important. Do you have health insurance? Yes. Do the other executives that you work with have health insurance? Yes, and we, seem, we have the same egalitarian health benefits for all of our employees, including those in fulfillment centers. So you're, everyone in the fulfillment center has health insurance? Yes. That is, is good news. Um, that is not necessarily what I, necessarily what I, folks in the audience seem to be indicating otherwise. And in terms of how many, how many hours a week do you, how many hours a day do you typically work? Uh, I think it varies. Uh, and right now in peak season, uh, you know, which is our, uh, our top uh, you know, season, uh, everyone uh, at the company is uh, all hands on deck. 
Are you working regularly? To, are you mandated by your contract to work 12-hour days? No. Uh, do you think that your employees should be mandated to work 12-hour days? So I think it. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific, uh, you know, incident or uh, kind of a question you, you were talking about. Uh, the will you agree that in New York City you will not require your employees to work more than eight-hour days? I, I, I'm right now I'm not in a position to negotiate uh, that, but happy to talk with you uh, more about what uh, concerns <coughs> or issues you might have. Would Amazon agree to voluntary labor standards that you will make sure everyone has health insurance, that they will have uh, disability insurance if they get hurt on the job, that they will have access to retirement so that if they work for you for 30 years, they're able to retire one day and that they will never be required to work more than eight hours? I would tell you, Amazon has world-class benefits. All of our employees have the same benefits, including health care, access to our educational benefits. Uh, we also have parental leave. So our fulfillment center workers are eligible for 20 weeks of parental leave, the same as those workers in our corporate offices. Please provide all that documentation. It seems that members of the audience Last who are question, workers counsel. don't believe what you are saying. Absolutely, sir. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Killers. Uh, Mr. Uh, Houseman, uh, Ms. Sullivan, there are uh, four more members who have a second round of questions, and if we, we were willing to put them on the clock for 90 seconds each, uh, not four minutes, are, are you okay? I know you wanted to leave here at one o'clock, but yes, speaker. Yeah. you're okay with that? Yes. Okay, so Thank I want to first go, uh, I don't think he's here. Oh, Stephen? No. Okay, no, no. So I want to first go to Councilman Van Bramer. So 90 seconds, we're keeping it right at a minute and a half. Thank you very much. I wanted to just uh, ask a couple of follow-up questions. One to Amazon, have you agreed to or are you having discussions, have you ever had discussions or open to uh, setting aside a certain amount of uh, the jobs for public housing residents or and or people in the district and or Queens or even setting uh, requirements that they would have already lived in Queens, say, for a certain number of years? So we don't have those agreements currently in place. Uh, we do have some provisions within the MOU to develop those career pathways specifically with Long Island City residents and Queensbridge Houses residents. So I, I just want to uh, uh, stress, and I, I think you know this, that while Queensbridge is the closest to you and, and incredibly important, Ravenswood, Astoria, Woodside Houses, all very, very close. Um, and so I hear that you're open to having uh, a certain percentage of the jobs uh, allocated to public housing residents. Council Member, we'd like to talk with you about this and really understand you know, what the types of jobs are, what the career pathways and the programs that are available so we can partner with those. We understand that's a concern and we also value those relationship with the residents of all public housing but also the uh, Long Island City. Thanks, so I'm on a clock and I have one last question for uh, James. The CAC and the amount of money that uh, they will ostensibly have an input in directing. Is that funding unlimited? As in, let's just say, public housing residents say there's a billion dollar capital need currently existing in those four developments, and that's the amount of funding we want for public housing, and then there's transportation, and then there's uh, schools and parks and all that stuff. Trying to get from you, is it just limited to that pilot fund, uh, or is it going to be what people really need? So it's not just limited to the pilot fund. Uh, we're willing to go above and beyond, make investments in the community, hopefully in a process with you and others that are critical um, <clears throat> for the existing community. You know, the, the, the taxes that are being paid here, we view them as an opportunity for us to make further investments, and we're prepared to do that yeah. in partnership with you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera. Thank you. So a lot of us have asked about the workforce development because we have some serious doubts about your internal goals and we haven't heard of a metric. We don't really know of your network of organizations in which you'll be speaking. And I did take a look at the current demographics of the people in your organization right now. It is very male and it is very white. And, and especially at the management level. So do you know how many engineers at Amazon didn't go to college or, or how many engineers instead pursued alternate coding educational programs that you hired? Because not all of us can get into Harvard. 
That's exactly right. Uh, we want to uh, have our engineers, our employees of all background, all life and educational backgrounds come uh, and work for us. Um, we don't have specifics for the workforce development partnerships yet, but we're having those conversations now. Uh, and we would love if there are, uh, to hear from you if there are specific groups that we should be speaking with. I mentioned some earlier, and, and, and EDC has a whole spreadsheet, I'm sure, of organizations that you should be talking to. But at this point in the game, we have so many doubts in, in terms of this deal that, that we're not getting any real answers from you. And, and we keep hearing that you're going to develop pathways, and, and you don't even have a, a goal for the Queensbridge houses next door, at least in terms of the, the housing. So in the land use review process, did you identify any other sites in Long Island City that we would be good for Amazon to build affordable housing to offset the effects of gentrification that Amazon will cause? <clears throat> oh, okay, so uh, you know, obviously we're committed to affordable housing across the city. There's currently um, Hunters Point South, which is immediately adjacent to, uh, or immediately south of Amazon's future location, um, is 5,000 units of housing, of which 60% will be affordable, and we're committed to building those out as affordable housing. And Councilmember Williams. Thank you. Um, the administration says it's dedicated to affordable housing, and action says something different. Um, to what my colleague said, I wanted to make sure I point out that the problem with the prime members is that it is uh, default is public, and that's how the uh, reporters were able to see who had and what was on it. Hopefully, uh, you will change that. I said before I didn't know who I was angry at, and that was because uh, Amazon, I think, I don't know who said it, my colleague put together a hunger style game which people were competing. Uh, but I think I'm more angry at the administration because we could have used the power of NYC not to engage in that and force them to change the way they do business and we did not. Uh, I just have three questions. One, uh, this is to Amazon. Uh, would you have not committed to this deal if we had to go to ULERP, and I wanted to reiterate uh, that EDC says this deal could not have been done without circumventing the power of the City Council in ULERP. I also want to know, I know our Deputy Mayor Glenn uh, thinks we are not particularly intelligent, even though she oversees a portfolio that has failed when it comes to affordable housing and NYCHA. I did want to know how engaged she was uh, in this process, or if Mr. Platchett was the uh, lead person. Uh, lastly, I wanted to ask if or okay. the EDC yeah. would commit That's to good. perhaps yeah. a pilot program uh, of a billion dollars, taxpayer money, to give to small businesses who agree to create X amount of jobs. And I think that's a great pol uh, a, pol a policy program because we don't have to give this money to the richest person in the world. We have small businesses uh, that need assistance right here. Um, I, can, I can go first and then, okay, so just, uh, <clears throat> Respectfully, Council Member, I hear you, but no administration uh, in the history of New York City has done more for affordable housing than this administration. We've built more affordable housing units. That than says any more other. about the previous administration than it does about no, us. Than any than any previous administration, but uh, fair. Excuse me. So not just the previous administration in the history. We have record number of homelessness. Right. Uh, and we have a NYCHA that you guys have failed to manage. So I don't want to hear what you've accomplished. I want to hear what we have the power to accomplish and did not. We are failing when it comes to income-targeted affordable housing, period. You cannot deny that. Okay. Well, I respectfully disagree. I agree that there are still remain issues in the city on affordability, and we're focused on addressing them. <clears throat> okay. We're going to uh, go to Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, can you Thank just answer you. the questions? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely happy to. Um, so the second question, I think, was the, avail the uh, involvement of Deputy Mayor Glenn. I, I report to Deputy Mayor Glenn. I certainly spoke to her as well as the mayor throughout this process. You know, EDC was the lead agency on this, but obviously I spoke with Deputy Mayor Glenn and the mayor throughout this process. And I'll, I can answer the ULOP question if you would like, um, Councilmember Williams, if that's okay, Speaker. Um, so on that question, you know, our priority, again, we're, we're not a developer, we're a company, and our priority is really creating the jobs, and so we have a specific timeline to be able to do that, um, to fulfill the obligations that we have on the, co on the company. Um, so we feel that the general project plan is the most efficient way, including the, economic, the environmental impact statement and the community meetings that we'll be doing. I think he answered that before. About the pilot the program? I believe he answered that before, but he can answer it again. Sorry, what's, um, what was I apologize? I said, would you put, agree to put, put together a pilot program, maybe a billion yes, dollars, to give tax abatements to small businesses who create jobs? Uh, we're ha happy to talk about how we can take advantage of these tax advantage, tax uh, 
revenues that we'll be receiving and work together on a plan for small businesses. All right, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, letting me ask a quick question. And along the same lines, um, for uh, Mr. Patchett, what's the advantage of diverting some of the tax revenue from Amazon away from the city's general fund mm -hmm. to the infrastructure fund to be managed by EDC when the city already has a process for making capital investments um, which, by the way, include the city council, unlike the EDC fund. Um, and specifically, um, the Citizens Budget Commission, for one, has described this roundabout process as a weakness of the city's approach to economic development. Uh, so, Council Member, I appreciate the question. Um, so, you know, I. There are two components to the infrastructure here. The first is a near-term conversation we're gonna have about how we can invest in infrastructure. But we recognize that we don't know what are gonna be the infrastructure needs in 15 or 20 years for this community. And so what this allows us to do is set aside funds that will be available over decades, not identified today, but so that we have a guarantee for this community that there will be money available for infrastructure investments. Would in the you future. be willing, I agree with that, yeah. would you be willing to incorporate into that guarantee for dedicated funds to that community that the city council would have input um, through the city's usual uh, budget approval process? If that's a priority of the city council, I'd be happy to do that. Thank All you. Right. And now for our closing questions and comments from Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I had a question. This is to both uh, Amazon and to EDC. There's a report uh, from uh, Politico, an article by Sally Goldenberg and Dana Rubenstein, uh, related to uh, New York City uh, promising to alert Amazon to public records requests in case the company wanted to try to obstruct those requests in court. Amazon, why did you ask the city to give you a heads up so that you could potentially take court-ordered action before the city could make uh, publicly available information uh, or available that should be publicly available to the media? So we asked all 20 finalist locations to sign uh, why? our standard non-disclosure agreement. Uh, we wanted to be able to share specific headcount information, specific team information, how we're set up as an organization also. Um, we are in a competitive environment. That's the reality of our business. And this allowed us to be able to have discussions, share information, be transparent with the state of New York and the city of New York, and share that relevant information so they could make informed decisions on whether or not this project was a fit. Uh, James, do you feel comfortable with that? So. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. So we, you know, we were presented with a non-disclosure agreement, and what we said to the company is, there's nothing about an NDA that's going to exempt us from FOIL laws. We are subject to those laws. It's our responsibility to the people of New York City and the state of New York to still be subject to FOIL regardless of an NDA. And so we insisted to them that that was a provision. Um, they, you know, the company, um, understood that. We didn't create a legal right for them to prevent us from, uh, to sharing documents under FOIL, that's a right that they have regardless of what it says in the NDA. Um, frankly, we would, what we would do is share information the way that we believe we should share information with the press, subject to FOIL, and the company, whether there was an NDA or not, would have the legal right to try to seek to block that. I asked a question earlier which, which wasn't uh, responded to in a specific way, mm -hmm. which is putting 32BJ and the building trades aside, did the city seek a labor peace agreement with Amazon for other workers separate from 32BJ and the building trades? Did EDC engage in conversations for a labor peace agreement? For, uh, you're speaking about the, for the distribution workers? For any other workers. So we spoke to the company about a number of different workers, not just 32BJ and the, and the, um, and the building trades. Um, we certainly discussed the distribution centers as a part of this conversation. Um, we were focused on the headquarters, not their other locations in the city, but Did we- Did you seek a labor peace agreement? That's the, that's the question, James. Did we speak, seek a labor peace agreement for their distribution facility? For all workers of Amazon in New York City, did you seek a- For labor every peace? single worker, including their corporate employees? No. Okay. Would you enter into a labor peace agreement so that your workers could unionize freely without any level of interference? 
We absolutely respect the right of an employee to this choose. This is what you said before, Mr. Hussman. That's not an answer. Would you support? You, would you support a labor peace agreement, which other companies enter in all the time in the city of New York? So, Speaker, I'm sorry, my answer is still the same. We respect an employee's right to choose what to do. So that's a no answer. You 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 would not uh, seek a labor peace agreement. Um, uh, James, we, we've heard that Amazon will be paying hundreds of millions of dollars, of course, in pilot payments. Uh, for folks that don't know pilots are, are payments in lieu of taxes. That means instead of paying the city's real estate taxes, they will pay state ESD. They'll, they'll pay, they'll, the, it's quite common for there to be a payment in lieu of taxes on publicly owned property. It goes through the state comes and comes to the city's uh, general fund. So ESD will put half the money into an infrastructure fund? Half of a, m the money on the existing public sites into an infrastructure and fund. And the other the half into the city's general fund. The remaining will go to the general fund. Um, why didn't you have Amazon uh, just pay the pilots to EDC instead? It's just the way it works under state law. It's just the mechanism, legal mechanism by which it's possible. I mean, we're, well, the city, the, we have, just so for clarity, there are arrangements like this on 42nd Street, which we've had for decades, and this, they come, money came through the state and always came to the city. It's never been an issue. Are there any guarantees that one day those pounds will be diverted to ESD to pay for a bridge somewhere in the middle of upstate New York? Yeah, there will be legal obligations under the document. So the money cannot be diverted? Correct. Okay. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm grateful that we've been able to have this conversation today. Again, I, I think that um, you should go through ULERP. And I think that's clear from how people feel today. I don't think you need $3 billion in city money when you're a trillion dollar company. I think that you should respect the rights of your workers and not interfere. Um, and, uh, but I really appreciate the fact that you came here today to have this conversation. Uh, we're having other hearings. Uh, is Amazon going to agree to come to those other public hearings that we have? We want to have an open dialogue and happy to have that conversation uh, about that specific issue. Uh, will you come to our future hearings? I will, I will be happy to talk with you uh, about that. Why won't you agree to come to our public hearings? I, uh, I think uh, this is best uh, for us to have a conversation about what you're envisioning, who the other witnesses would be, the timing. So happy to have a conversation with you about that. I cannot commit today. Why? Because I'm I, I cannot you're not giving commit a reason. without You're not giving a reason. I don't know the specific details, Speaker, but happy to talk with you. The Memorandum of Understanding yeah. says you'll participate in public hearings. That's what the MOU says. Yes, sir. So are you going to come to our future hearings or not? We will be participating actively in the community process. If you're talking about a specific council hearing, I'm happy to have a conversation with no, you. No, no, I'm about. having the conversation <laughs> right now with you in public, in front of the public, in front of the press. You're a trillion dollar company that's coming to New York City. You're avoiding the land use process. You're taking $3 billion in money and you won't agree to come to public hearings? Sir, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about the specifics of those, about when those hearings. But we do want to have an ongoing dialogue with you and be an active participant in this No, process. I don't want a private ongoing dialogue. I want a public dialogue where the public can come and the press can be there and you will participate. Is this what you think being a good neighbor is and coming to New York City, not coming to one hearing but not agreeing to come to other hearings? Sir, I, will ha I do not know the specifics of when you're planning these hearings, who the other witnesses we will We will put the hearings around your schedule so you can be there. Okay. Will happy you come? To, happy, happy to have those conversations. We fully intend to, ha to be an additional public. Are you uh, a former this. federal prosecutor? Yes, sir. I mean, we want you to answer questions directly not avoid the answering of questions, which is what you're doing right now. So, we expect for you to be at our public hearings, and the MOU says that, does the city think that Amazon should be at our public hearings? We expect the company to attend public no, hearings. No, no, do you want Amazon to yes. be, not expect, do you want Amazon right. to be there? I you said, yes. So the city administration wants you to be there, the council wants you to be there, but you won't agree to come to our public hearings? 
Because we want to be an active participant in this. I'm, I really have been just trying to uh, to uh, figure out, you know, what is best uh, for the level for of the, hubris the that is involved. I do not mean to. I do not mean. I'm sorry, sir. I'm very. I, I'm humbled and grateful. We will definitely participate, uh, in, you know, in future processes. I'm just. You're asking me to commit to a, spe a specific hearing, uh, and I, no, I didn't ask for a specific date. I'm asking for you to come to a future hearing. Ab will you agree? Ab absolutely, sir. Absolutely. We'll okay, so you're going to come to a future hearing. hearing. Future we hearing. look forward to scheduling that future hearing in January and in February around your schedule. Then we'll have a public hearing for the public as well to be able to come and testify. And we look forward to scheduling those hearings around your schedule so that you and the Amazon team, who said at the outset you're proud to come to New York City because of what our city stands for, <coughs> you should come and participate in a public manner before the city council with the public and the duly democratically elected officials who represent the neighborhood of New York City, you should come to those hearings. So I look forward to you coming to those hearings. I'm grateful you're here today. It shouldn't have been that hard for you to say, Mr. Houseman, that you would come to the hearings. I am really actually taken aback by how difficult it was for you to say, it is insulting for you not to say right away, Mr. Speaker, City Council, we do want to come to New York City. We do want to be involved in the community. We do want to be a good neighbor. So we're going to come and we're going to answer your questions. What you've said before in this testimony is that you look forward to engaging with us uh, on the Community Advisory Council. You look forward to engaging with us to understand the issues around local hiring. You look forward to engaging with us on the issues that matter to the community. You can't say that in a platitudinal way in the course of this hearing and then at the end of the hearing when you're asked if you'll come to future hearings, not give a straight answer. It's insulting. It's unacceptable. It's not how you'd be a good neighbor. And I don't understand the, t the level of tone deafness in trying to give a cute, evasive answer on this. Do you understand why it's offensive? Speaker, I'm sorry, I did not mean to kind of offend you. I did not mean uh, to, to appear that we were not sensitive to concerns of you or the other council members. I was really just talking about uh, specific uh, kind of dates and formats of the We hearing. will find a date that works for you, and we look forward to you participating in that date since you're going to come to New York City with 25,000 jobs, and you're getting $3 billion in taxpayer money, and you're getting public land in New York City. It, we have our expectation <coughs> that you will be at those hearings. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, big thank you to the staff who, in a very short period of time, so Alex, Emily, and Aaliyah, and our staff to put this together, Speaker Johnson, and all the council members of state. Thank you to Amazon for staying for the full hearing. Mr. Patchett, President Patchett, and your team, thank, thank you. you. We look forward to our future hearings. And with that, today's hearing is closed. Thank you.